a lot of people have different meanings when, when they say carnivore, right? They'll just see when you're eating carnivore, they just mean they're going to eat a lot more meat and they'll eat less plants, but they're still drinking coffee, still using artificial sweeteners, still doing X, Y, and Z and, and whatever. But the main thing is that, um, you know, the, the whole point of, the, of a carnivore diet is you're, you're eliminating out all these different, you know, plants and artificial sweeteners and sugars and all that sort of other garbage and you're giving your body what you need, which is fatty meat. The line diet is just red meat, basically. Someone asked about the um, blood type diet. What's your take on consuming blood? Is it a significant part of the animal rich in nutrients? Is it beneficial? Is it safe? Should we consume it? uh, to waste less of the animal. So I think, I think eating blood is, is not a bad idea at all. There's plenty of people that do it, uh, like the Maasai, uh, that's, that's what they subsist on. And, um, you know, like the Mongols, Mongol horde, and even like people, you know, currently living there now, they, they drink blood all the time, horse blood, mare's blood, cow's blood, things like that. So there's tons of nutrients. It's very, very healthy. Uh, depends on your source. Obviously you can get these things that are contaminated, and, um, and that can be a problem. So, you know, you don't want to, um, you know, just, uh, you know, get it from any source, but if you're getting it from a butcher, you're getting it from, you know, a, a proper source, it should be fine. And, uh, but yeah, no, it's very, very healthy. Blood is very, very healthy. I don't think you have to have it, but I think it, if you do have it, I think it's a, it's a perfectly fine addition. Um, so we have a few questions that were sent in. So I'm probably going to start with those and then people can um, also uh, tune in and, and say sort of different things that they want to talk about as well. Um, but we'll do these first. So these were sent in by um, by the, the people who are in my Patreon group. And so thank you to all those who who submitted those questions. Um so from Carees, uh, they say, I am scheduled to have an acoustic neuroma mo removed next month. Do you have any advice for steps to take before surgery and then in hospital and post-op? I'm not sure how to make uh, my wishes for no sugar limited pharma taken seriously. So, well, I mean, just in general for any surgery, you just need to be as healthy as you can and, um, and let your body be in a very, very good state so that you can heal properly, uh, from the surgery. Obviously it's a very big surgery. Acoustic neuroma is a big tumor, um, in the back of the head that, um, well, can, can be big, it can be small, but, but quite often these things get, get to be quite big and then we have to, we have to remove them. And so you need to just be in, you know, good physical health and obviously diet and exercise is a very good, important part of that. Um, as far as convincing, um, as, uh, as far as convincing the hospital not to feed you, you know, highly processed sugary carbs, that's, that's going to be a, a fight and a struggle. That's just all that they have. You can try and say that you have allergies. You say, look, I really can't eat anything. Just, I mean, I can eat like meat and eggs, but you know, I really don't trust anything else. I can't, I can't eat anything else. So just, uh, you know, be mindful of that. And so, um, that's really the best way to do it. And then otherwise, uh, you can just sort of pick through the stuff that you want to eat and, and throw away the stuff that you don't want and then have your friends and family bring in uh, actual real food, which is what you probably will have to do uh, because the hospital is just, the food there is just appalling. It's just appalling. You know, when, when you're considering these are the people that are sickest and need the most help, they're giving them the absolute worst garbage and, uh, and it's appalling. So, um, so that's what I would do. Um, so next question is from Madeline. Uh, she says, I found out that I am deficient in magnesium and calcium. So I'm wondering how to get more of those in my diet. Um, especially calcium seems to be a bit tricky and I can have high histamine foods like sardines or HG and I can't have high, high, high histamine, sardine, uh, histamine foods like sardines or aged cheese. Uh, any suggestions? Well, if there's other dairy that you are able to take uh, that doesn't give you that reaction. You can try those. You can try just a calcium supplement if you want. Um, any bone broth, things like that, that's going to have a, a ton of calcium in it. And um, you know, magnesium, generally, it's quite rare for people to be deficient in magnesium on a carnivore diet. I don't know how long you've been on a carnivore diet, uh, but that usually normals, uh, normalizes. But if you take like a supplement, just a, a tablet. Like if that's the thing, like if, if, if you are a deficient, like actually diagnosed deficient for any reason, 
um, you know, then then it's not actually a bad idea to supplement or take something. You know, most people won't be. Most people will just get everything that they need. But you know, there are a number of different reasons why someone might be a bit deficient in something. Um, but you know, it's it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day if you are deficient. You should probably just take something for that. And so, taking a bit of a supplement is is not that big of a deal. Uh, it's generally going to be probably short term, and then you're going to be um, you know, able to just maintain everything uh, with a carnivore diet, you know, it may just be that you're just at a deficiency, you know, from previous uh, diets and that you need to catch up and having some supplements and that that's fine. It's fine to do that. Um, someone asked about how to deal with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, that's basically caused by uh, fructose and, uh, and, and excess carbs. So uh, just cut out the carbs, cut out the sugar and, uh, and that should just sort itself out. Um, and someone said, do I eat fat or do I train fasted? Yes, I absolutely do train fasted. I always feel much better when I train fasted. Um, and so I just, that's just me that I just always feel better that way. Um, you know, when you're, when you're eating, you're, you're pulling a lot of blood to your digestive tract, which takes a lot of blood, takes a lot of uh, energy to, to run your digestion. And so you're taking that muscle, that, that blood away from every, everywhere else. And so, you know, you go into like a rest and digest mode where you want to like just hunker down and, and conserve energy. And so you're not going to have as much energy for, for working out. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's physiologically what's happening, but also just, uh, I, that's what I experienced. That, that's what I've always experienced. And I think uh, a lot of people are the same. A lot of the, uh, you know, top athletes that I've, I've trained with and played with, they've always, um, agreed with me. They've always, they've always done much better, uh, on an empty stomach. There was a lot of, I, I wasn't the only one who refused to eat the day of a game. Like I never, I would never eat before a game, even the whole day, even if it was like a night game, it was like seven o'clock that night. I would not, I would not eat the whole day or a tournament we're playing the whole time. You know, I, I would never do that. So, um, that's, uh, that's how I felt, um, better. And Douglas, thank you very much for the super chat. That's awesome. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Um, okay. So, and then, uh, so, Back to the question. So Madeline asks, how bad is farmed salmon? Farmed salmon is not great. Um, it's still meat, but you know, the, the farmed salmon generally they give them like like you know, grain pellets. So it's it's just like it's just like grain fed beef. So they actually you're reducing the amount of omega threes that they're getting. So now you have fish that's normally very high in omega threes. Now they're getting a lot more omega sixes than omega threes, still not as much as you know, like seed oils and 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 all that, but it's uh it's not great. And so you don't want to eat farmed salmon if you if you can avoid it. It's just you know uh, sometimes it's just what, whatever's available. You know any port in a storm, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's problematic because they just feed the the, the animals the wrong stuff. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for the super chat. That's very kind of you. Um, so he asks, uh, what about cardio? I weight train regularly. I eat carnivore late twenties. Is there a benefit to doing? Um, Example, 70 to 80% max heart rate cardio, 75 minutes a week. Is that good for the heart? Yeah, it'd be fine. You know, you'll, you'll get your heart rate pumping um, doing anaerobic activity as well. Um, you'll also exert more energy and, 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 and uh, stimulate growth hormone and testosterone production in, uh, in men especially. And so that, that's something good. I cardio as as far as just like just running for extended periods of time uh ad nauseum that was never that was never my thing um i was always um i always liked like explosive sort of training and so i trained for what i was doing so it depends on what you're doing um if you just want to be fit and uh and look good and just you know just lift weights that that's uh, more than enough maybe you know warm up on the exercise bike or something like that and then hit it but um that's really all you need to do is the weights uh, and you'll look good. You'll feel good. Uh, for me, I, you know, I, I was training for sports. I was training for rugby and things like that. So I was, I, I wanted explosion. I wanted to uh, be very explosive on, on the field and on my feet. And so I wanted, I did sprints. I did a lot of sprints and hill work and hill and, um, uh, stair sprints, things like that. And a lot of like plyometric sort of things. So I had that explosive power and, um, and then trained in sort of game specific drills, 
that would, uh, you know, train my body and get that muscle memory going. So I could, you know, I could, you know, blast people at, at, uh, at high speed when the time came without it was sort of just instinctually. Um, so it depends on what you're training for. I like hard sprints. I like, I like feeling dynamic. I like being able to, you know, be able to have that feeling that I could just go and, you know, just sprint, you know, for however long half marathon or something like that. And it's like, get away from trouble or, you know, chase down an elk or something like that, or uh, a fly half. And, um, and uh, I like that. I like feeling, uh, that mobility. I like feeling fit. It's, it's a good feeling. Um, so I like cardio for that, but I don't just like just running forever. I like like wind sprints and, um, you know, dynamic explosive sort of work. So that's the kind of stuff that I do. Um, but again, it depends on what you're, what you're training for and what you're going for. Hope that answers that. Um, so, okay. So Mike, you followed up. So really lifting and being in shape with carnivore sufficient. I'm not, uh, it's not bad to ignore cardio due to that. No, not at all. No, you don't need to do that. It, but again, if, if you're just, if you're just going for health and, um, you know, physique, then yeah, just, just lifting weights is fine. Um, I don't think you're missing out on anything by not running ad nauseum. There's, there's a lot of people like, um, you know, Dr. John Jaquish, who would argue that actually you're probably, uh, you know, hurting, your, you know, not hurting yourself, but you know, it's a detriment, um, to go do extended cardio because you'll end up increasing cortisol and suppressing testosterone and, um, uh, testosterone and, um, and growth hormones. So you'll sort of do the opposite of what weights will do. Um, and so that can sort of, you know, stall your gains and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, at, at the moment I'm basically only doing weights, you know, my, my, I do a bit more on the, on the stationary bike now because I'm rehabbing my knee after getting it scoped, but, uh, but that's it. Okay. Mike, glad, glad you like that. That's good. Um, all right. So another question that we had submitted, uh, was from Jason. Um, what do you do to fight cold or chest cold or sickness in general? Uh, do you have personal tips and tricks for a carnivore quick recovery, such as food you recommend or hydration, uh, with bone broth? Um, I, I still listen to my body on this. I still will, will, um, you know, if I, if I have sort of lose my appetite, I'll just sort of let it go. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to eat anything besides meat, but I might do some broth or I'll drink more water. I, I generally focus on, um, hydration, but you know, I really haven't been sick in years, you know, um, I had, I got COVID and that was, I was sort of down for a day and just sort of slept the whole time. And then after that I felt better, but I was just very tired and, uh, and I just didn't have an, an appetite. So I just basically didn't, didn't eat much for about a week and I lost probably like 10 pounds, you know, which was, which wasn't good. I mean, I didn't have like 10 pounds to lose, but, um, you know, came back, you know, after you, you, uh, sort of get your, your, um, appetite back. So I think the main thing is just, just listening to your body. If your body's telling you to, to, to not eat then then don't eat, you know, just take it easy, get some fluids in you. And, um, you know, if it's going on, it's a prolonged thing and you're sort of getting emaciated. Well, then you just, you just need to, you need to, you need to eat something, but, uh, generally it's okay to fast. Generally it's okay to just let your body do its thing and just rest. I mean, I think the most important thing when you're sick is sleep, sleep and water and, um, and you let your body just get over it. Um, okay. So we had a question here as well. Dr. Chafee, I uh, got a, got a question. I am now two weeks into carnivore and I'm 22 years old. I've noticed a big decrease in rep strength and stamina in the gym went from hundred kg uh, times 10 to hundred kg times five. Is that typical? It can be, um, you're, you're, it sounds like you're not fat adapted yet. And you're, while your body's running on ketones, your body's not used to running on ketones. And so it takes a bit of time. So um, Professor Tim Noakes has done a ton of, of, of research on uh, athletics in general and training in in, um, in ketosis as well. And, um, and they did a study where basically after people got fat adapted, they didn't find any difference in their, in their exercise um, tolerance and output and all that sort of stuff compared to people that were just eating a whole bunch of carbs and taking the energy drinks. And I don't know if they're doing energy drinks, but they're doing a bunch of carbs. And then they switched the groups. 
And so they gave him like 42 days to like get fat adapted and just do keto. And then they test him again and they were fine. Everyone was fine. Um, they all, they all performed to the same extent. And, um, and so they said they thought it would probably take 42 days to, for everyone to get fat adapted, but they found that actually most people were getting fat adapted at about the three week mark. So just keep it up, keep, keep going with it. Um, make sure you're eating enough as well. That's, that's one thing that most people find that their hunger signals change dramatically, uh, on a carnivore diet. And so you have to, uh, make sure that you're eating enough and I go by taste. So if meat tastes good, that means you're still hungry. You need to keep eating, keep eating until meat stops tasting good. And you just go like, Ugh, I don't really want to eat this anymore. Try eating a couple times a day as well. Especially if you're working out a lot, you're a young guy, you know, you're trying to build muscle, you're trying to get, uh, you know, get in the gym a lot. You need to, you need to, you're going to need to eat a lot more than other people that are living a sedentary life. Um, and so if you're not getting enough, and you're not getting enough fat in particular, you're not going to have as much energy in the gym. You're not going to perform as well. Um, after that, it's a matter of getting keto adapted and, 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 uh, fat adapted, which will happen. It will happen all, all on its own. You're two weeks into it. It generally doesn't take more than three weeks for me. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't take any, any time at all. It was like day one, I was better. Uh, and so, um, just, uh, you know, just keep it up. And, uh, it, it, you know, before too long, you'll, you'll notice and just make sure you're eating enough, make sure you're resting enough and just, uh, um, give it a bit of time and, and you'll be fine. Hey everyone. I hope you're enjoying this replay of my YouTube live. If you'd like to catch a live version and ask your own questions, please go to the next scheduled one, usually every Thursday at 6 PM Pacific standard time. All right. See you then. And please enjoy the rest of the Q and a. Okay. So, uh, living large asks, Started Ketovore four months ago, 66 years old with a stent and a AAA open repair in 2020. Stopped a statin in February of this year against orders. Doing great, but unsure of my statin decision, lifting five days a week. So statins and medications are very particular for particular people. So it's very hard on that one sentence or two sentences to, to give you very good advice. However, I can tell you that there are a number of studies that have come out with large number of people, tens of thousands um, of people, that um, that that show that there's probably you know little to no benefit from statins, uh, especially if you haven't had a cardiovascular event. Now you have a AAA, so that means you have you know are, are, you know um, you know atherosclerotic sclerotic disease. Um, and so you might be in that camp, but at the same time, if you're eating as you are and your HDL is high and your triglycerides are low and you're in ketosis, um, you know, there's a paper that just got published, um, from professor Ben Bickman and Dr. Paul Mason and I, uh, Dr. Diamond basically arguing, going through all the literature saying that, look, if you're in this, in this state where your HDL is high, your triglycerides are low and you're on a ketogenic diet or, or even carnivore diet, that, uh, statins really aren't, aren't going to be, um, a benefit to you and that your LDL, whatever it is, 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 it's fine. So that's, that's what is uh, out there at the moment. So, um, if that helps you, uh, sort of make a decision on what you want to do with your statins. Um, okay. So I think it's like someone was saying that there was, you know, might be a problem with his, with my sound on Instagram, but I think there's only one person. Can people hear me on Instagram? Hopefully maybe some people just say some yeses or something like that. Christ. All right. Well, they're not saying anything, so I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if they can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So Matthew asks, did I see or listen to Dr. Barry's interview with Paul Saladino recently? And if so, are there things that you'd like to say about it? I, I haven't watched it yet. Um, I haven't had the time uh, so far, but it is something I plan on watching. I, you know, I, I, I like and respect both of those guys. And so, and I've, I've spoken and met, um, uh, Dr. Barry online. I haven't met Dr. Saladino online, but I agree with a ton of things that he says. Um, but um, uh, it would be very interesting to sort of see that and uh, and and see what they spoke about. And uh, yeah, and when I when I do, I will definitely 
uh, be happy to, to talk about and give my thoughts on that. Um, also from Matthew, when you say that coffee is harmful to our health, do you specifically mean the beverage as a whole, or is it about the caffeine or maybe even other things uh, than the coffee? Dr. Barry didn't talk about it in the talk with Paul, uh, but he mentioned multiple times in his own lives with Nisha that people have been trying to prove coffee's toxicity for, for some decades, sometimes with a lot of money and vested interest in doing so, but the research never went anywhere as it really seemed uh, seems that the coffee is harmless, with the caveat that I suppose all these studies were done on sad eating plants, um, plant eating populations. I remember Dr. Berry even said multiple times that no one had been able to prove that coffee or at least caffeine was toxic for children, babies, or even in pregnant women, and that it was not um, by lack of trying or lack of resources or bias. So he's asking if my opinion, is my opinion based on first principles and an abundance of caution, or do you have specific things, resources to point to in the regards for coffee? Yeah, so the first one. So my uh, opinion is just based on the on the on the first principle is that the coffee bean is a seed, a seed is the plant's baby. This is where you generally find uh, the most um, you know defense chemicals that are in there. And so heating it up, roasting these things, it's going to denature some of these things, but it's not going to get rid of all of them. Um, and so the I mean there's just documented um, you know plant defense chemicals that, that are in coffee beans. Uh, caffeine is one of them, uh, but it's not just caffeine, but caffeine was, was, uh, you know, it's, it's an insect, it's an insecticide, you know, and it's a neurotoxin. And so while we don't get blasted by these things, uh, like a bug would, um, it doesn't, doesn't mean that it doesn't have effects on our body and our brain. I mean, that's the, that's the effect we're going for is getting us amped up on caffeine. And, um, and so some people like that and that's fine, but I've known people, uh, who've gone carnivore and fixed their seizures and then had a cup of coffee and, you know, had a seizure. So, you know, that's, that's a big trigger for them, um, uh, for, for epilepsy. So, you know, it, it can affect you, you know, and, and whether that effect is large or small, there is an effect. And for me, I just like, you know, that whole, my body's a temple sort of thing and just don't, don't let anything in there. Uh, don't let the, the riffraff in, um, as far as you know, studies and things, I you know I, I'm, I'm sure I would uh, agree with Dr. Barry. I'm sure they're, you know, I'm sure that he's right in that. He's 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 very well researched in these sorts of things. He he, he takes a lot of time and care to look into things. So I'm I'm sure he's right there. Um, there was someone who mentioned there's like someone wrote a book about coffee and it not being great for you, but it could be that that's based on, um, you know, uh, you know, poor data. I don't know. I haven't read the book. But just for me, just thinking about that in that way um, is I, I'm, I'm a bit cautious with it. But then when I've tried it and tried adding that back in, I have felt worse. And when I don't get sore after I work out at all, when I drink a cup of coffee, I'm sore for two days after working out. You know, so that so I know that there's something happening there. Obviously, there's something going on in my body. There's you know the increased you know inflammation, pain, swelling, stiffness. Uh, something that's causing that soreness and stiffness. And I don't like that. I don't like being sore. I like being, uh, you know, just uh, being able to work out like crazy and not have a problem with it. So for me, coffee's out, but that doesn't mean that uh, everybody uh, has to do that. You know, if people uh, don't mind the effects or even enjoy the effects of, of caffeine or just the experience of the coffee, you know, go for it. And if it, you know, if what's, um, what's going on, making you sore or whatever, isn't, isn't, you know, something that you really care that much about, then, you know, go for it. Um, I was, I was talking to someone, um, uh, who was, uh, you know, she was great. She just had like a you know big workout. She was all happy. And, you know, it's just like, yeah, this great workout, you know, really pushed myself, really feel proud about it, which was awesome. And then, um, and then she said, yeah, but I'm, I'm still sore, you know, like four days later from it. And so I was like, what are you eating? You know, I was like, oh, well, you know, just, just meat, like, that's it. I was like still drinking coffee. And like, Yes. Yeah. I'm still drinking coffee. And so it was like, you know, it's something that, um, you know, you'll see in other people as well. And I think that, uh, a lot of people, when I speak to them about, uh, working out and getting sore and they say like, oh yeah, no, I still get sore after working out. They're almost always invariably, they will be eating something from the plant kingdom, but it's almost always coffee. They'll always, almost always have coffee. And I just tell them like, 
well, that's what it's from. And, uh, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to experience that, you know, you know, that, that, um, phenomenon of not getting sore, uh, from working out if you're drinking coffee, because it will just, it has stuff in it that makes you sore. So that's it. And it says, all right, I'm stopping coffee in 2023. May the Lord help me and everyone around you while you're, while you're withdrawing. But, um, no, I think, I think you feel good. I think a lot of people that I've spoken to, um, a lot of people that I've spoken to that have come off coffee, they, they've all really, uh, benefited from that and they've all really liked it. Um, so I think that, uh, it's worth trying anyway, you know, you just come off something for a month and just see, and just see how you feel. And if you just you're like, yeah, I like the coffee more then you know, go back to the coffee. It's not a big deal, but at least, you know, at least you now, you know, so, um, someone asks, you know, what kind of whey protein I would go for, um, for recovery. I, you know, if you're just eating a carnivore diet, you're getting, you're getting hundreds of grams of protein. You like, you really don't need, um, to take any, uh, excess protein on, in a powder form. But if you want to, and if you do, then I would just suggest getting whatever has, um, a, the least amount of, um, additives or just, just straight whey protein or egg protein or beef isolate protein. Um, just because you don't want all that, that other nonsense in there. You don't want all those artificial sweeteners and things like that, or God forbid sugars. So I would just get the protein that just has that, you know, there's a quit protein, um, who, uh, I've, I've tried before and they, you know, they, they sponsor me, have like an affiliate link and things like that. If people want to look that up, um, you know, that has, they have stuff that's just like the beef and just collagen. And it's just like nothing else. And I think there's like naked, naked whey or naked protein or something like that, um, which I'm not affiliated with, but I think that's another one that, um, that, uh, just does straight up protein with no additives. And it's funny enough, like the stuff with additives is cheaper than the stuff without additives. You'd think that, you know, you're adding less stuff to it, so it should be cheaper, but I think it's just because it's a niche market. There isn't really that many people going for it. So it's just a bit more, it's, it's, it's different. It's separate from the norm. And so it's just a bit more expensive because of that. Um, sorry, I actually saw a question there that I was, uh, thoughts on carnivore to help infertility. Yeah. So, um, you can look at the work of, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Kilt, uh, who, who's great. He's got, um, he's got his own podcast. I've been on that. He's been on mine and, um, and he's a fertility doctor. You know, he actually does, um, uh, uh, he has a, a fertility clinic. He's like one of the largest fertility clinics in, uh, in America. And, uh, and he, you know, commonly, um, talks about how, you know, diet, nutrition and carnivore can actually help your, your hormones and get, and get you pregnant and, uh, and help that pregnancy be very, very healthy. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend, uh, looking at his stuff. Um, and, uh, and you can see more there, but just long story short, it's going to optimize your, your hormonal balance and your hormonal levels. So your sex hormones, um, you know, estrogen, progestogen, uh, progesterone, um, and progestogens and, um, and testosterone levels is going to optimize those for, for men and women. Um, I mean, even just going on a keto diet is really going to help women with, pre with fertility as well, because when you eat sugar or carbs, your blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up in, uh, correspondingly. And then you, um, and then that insulin actually blocks the conversion of testosterone into estrogen in the ovaries. So women don't make estrogen directly. They make a whole bunch of different precursors and then they make, um, testosterone and then they convert that testosterone into estrogen at, at their uh, ovaries. And so estrogen can actually block that. And so, um, if you have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, high, high insulin all the time, then you're going to actually have higher testosterone and lower estrogen than your body actually wants to. And obviously that can mess with fertility. This also is one of the, uh, uh causes of, uh, PCOS polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the leading cause of, um, infertility in women around the world. So that's, uh, just a couple of different ways that that can help, but it will, it will absolutely, uh, help from, from what we can see. Oh, and how about bulletproof coffee? So yeah, I mean, bulletproof coffee, you're, you're getting the good stuff from the, from the fats and that's great, but, um, it's, uh, it's got the coffee in it. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna get rid of the stuff that's in the coffee. So even if you dress it up however you want, it's still going to have the coffee in it. So it's just like, you know, if you put, 
uh, you know, cocaine in your tea or something like that. And you're like, oh, but it's, but it's with tea. So it's not really cocaine, is it? And it's like, well, no, it's the cocaine is still in there. Right. So the coffee's still in there, even though you have the butter as well. So just, you know, maybe just eat the butter and, uh, and, uh, well, you know, and, uh, uh, Serena goes by Serena carnivore online. Uh, she makes bulletproof water. She just, just blends up hot water and, and butter. And she says it tastes really good and frothy and nice and warm. So uh, you can try that. Can the line diet be better for treating autoimmune disease than carnivore and why? Well, I mean, I mean, the carnivore is the line diet. I mean, that's sort of the same thing. I mean, I guess it's like the line diet is just a bit more strict than um, carnivore. But, you know, that's the thing, too, is a lot of people, a lot of people, have different meanings when, when they say carnivore, right? They'll just see when you're eating carnivore, they just basically, um, they just mean they're going to eat a lot more meat and they'll eat less plants, but they're still drinking coffee, still using artificial sweeteners, still doing X, Y, and Z and, and whatever, but you know, and using, yeah, like monk fruit sweetener and sugar and all that sort of stuff. I see a lot of people that do that. And so, you know, the main thing is that, um, you know, the, the whole point of, the, of a carnivore diet is you're, you're eliminating out all these different, you know, plants and artificial sweeteners and sugars and all that sort of other garbage. And you're giving your body what you need, which is fatty meat. Um, the line diet is just red meat, basically. So for people who don't know that line diet is a carnivore diet, but it's just red meat, you know, just, um, just, uh, you know, like just ruminant animals, which I think are the best. I think those are definitely the healthiest. They have, have the best, um, the best ability to to break down uh, toxins and gunk and uh, and and in, ingest good things and uh, and pass those on to you. So I think those are healthier. Um, as far as autoimmune issues are concerned, yes, I do. I uh, this is something that that you do see, and I've talked to uh, you know Dr. Paul Mason about this in the in the in the set of interviews that I did with him that I'll be publishing here in the in the coming weeks, sort of in a three part series. Um, you know, there are, there are things that are in like chicken and fish and dairy that can actually be, uh, pro-inflammatory can actually raise your, 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 uh, CRP and, uh, and can raise your autoimmune antibodies, uh, for these, these sorts of things. And so, you know, you definitely want to get rid of the plants. You definitely want to go just, just meat. If you have, especially if you have autoimmune issues, autoimmune issues respond very, very, very well to a uh, carnivore diet. Um, but they're just going to be a bit more sensitive, you know, especially while their, their guts healing, we have this leaky gut problems, things are going to get in that aren't supposed to get in and you have problems. Um, um, no, you don't have to supplement just to someone there. Um, and so, but people that are, have autoimmune should also stay away from dairy should also stay away from like chicken and pork and, and I guess fish. Uh, as well, according to Dr. Uh, Mason, I've certainly seen people have problems uh, just just in practice with uh, chicken and pork, though, and certainly dairy. So, um, just something, just things to be aware of. Generally, people with autoimmune issues should really try to go for the lion diet side of things, like just the red meat and water and uh, grass fed if you can, obviously, because if the animal is eating what it's supposed to eat, then it's going to be able to break down those toxins very safely. And so those, those toxins aren't going to get passed on to you, but if it's eating something else that it doesn't normally do, then maybe things are going to get, get in there that it doesn't, uh, that you don't actually want. Um, so someone's asking sashimi, sushi, are they carnivore? Well, the sashimi is sushi, you know, is, uh, comes with rice. So that's, that's the stuff you don't want, but raw fish. Yeah, definitely go for it. And sorry, no. Um, then Doug asks, I use primal kitchen sauces in ground beef. Should I remove those? I don't, I don't know exactly what's in, in, um, primal kitchen sauces. I don't know who makes primal kitchen sauces. You know, who, who does that? I, I don't know, but I guess it's, just, I guess just read the label and just see what it is. You know, if it's got a bunch of, you know, plants in it and sugar, then I would probably stay away from that, you know? Um, and, uh, so I would, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use any of that anyway. But um, I would I would certainly sort of take a look if it's using capsicums and tomato uh, base and all these sorts of things. Those are all nightshades, and those are you know if you're going to eat any plants, I think staying away from the nightshades is is uh, it's probably a good idea. Um, 
So that would just be me though. Just take take a look at the ingredients and see if that's something you want. If it's got a bunch of nightshades and it has, has sugar in it. I would just I would I would not. But um, that's uh, that's just me. You guys can can do what you want. You can always just try them without, and you can always just try eating it without it and see how you feel. See if you feel if you see if you're doing any better. And then after a couple of weeks, you know, maybe sample it back in. Maybe give it a month just to actually give it a, a proper test. And um, and then. You know, you can introduce it back in, see how you feel. You know, it's pretty, uh, pretty good way of doing it. Um, so let's see here. Um, so whenever I try eating meat only, I end up throwing up after two days. As soon as I eat some kind of carb, I feel instantly better. Um, well, you shouldn't be eating to the point that you're sick, you know. And and the thing is, is that a lot of people especially when they're trying to lose weight. I don't know if you're trying to lose weight, but a lot of people uh, are used to eating, you know, very large portions and they, um, they switch to carnivore and their body just goes, Hey, you know, we don't need all that. You know, we're, we're fine. We've got a lot of energy here. And, um, and so just take it easy. And then all of a sudden it just starts tasting horrible because instead of getting positive feedback uh, from your body saying, you know, keep eating, this is good for you, you start getting negative feedback saying, hey, stop it, cut it out. And so some people can get sort of uh, um, nauseated from that. Uh, if you're getting to the point where you're you're throwing up or you're getting sick, I, I think you're just, you're eating way too much. And I think you just need to stop um, or you, at least you can stop. And so you, you, you have to understand too, that you don't actually necessarily need to eat as much as we, we, have been eating and we think we need to eat, uh, especially if you're losing weight, if you have excess body fat, your body is going to recognize that and just say, Hey, you know, we, we have enough of this. You don't need to eat. I mean, I've, I've gone, um, after, you know, working out for, you know, six, eight hours, um, thinking like, why well, I have to, I have to eat because I'm gonna, you know, I've just done a massive workout and I'm, I'm going to have a massive workout tomorrow. So I have to eat because I, I need that energy or else I'll just die or something like that. And obviously I had weeks of energy, just stored in my fat tissue. And, um, and I didn't think about it properly, but there was just like everything in my body was just like, do not eat a steak. That sounds horrible. And I sort of tried to make myself, um, eat it. And, uh, and I just wasn't enjoying it. I was just like, gosh, I am just really not enjoying this. And so I just stopped. And the next day I felt great, I had great energy. And then, uh, and then, you know, meat tasted good again. So I think if, if meat's not tasting good and you're not enjoying it, and certainly if it's making you nauseous, just, just, you know, think about that as your body just telling you that you don't, you don't need to eat. And so you just take it easy. And, um, and you can also have withdrawals and, and other sorts of, uh, other sorts of problems that can make you feel a bit crummy and, and those would just go away. So those you just sort of push through. So those would be the two things that I, that I think would be covering 95% of people in your situation. Um, so let's see, I'm on week two and I notice when I eat red meat with salt and butter, I often feel my heart rate elevated. Is that normal? It can be. Um, I noticed early on that I, I, I not that I had a, a fast heartbeat, but it was like a strong heartbeat. And um, I was um, I was looking at a few things and it, it appears to be that when people are doing this, they, they, they can get ECGs and things like that, EKGs. And, uh, and it's not an abnormal rhythm, uh, but they have like a, like a, a pattern that is, um, typically seen in people that, uh, are getting, or are building up their health and building up their cardiovascular health. So when they're like athletes are getting fit and they're working out like sort of the beginning of the season, they sort of notice that same sort of rhythm, their heart's sort of getting in shape. So I think of it as a good thing. I think of it as your body and your heart actually, you know, getting stronger and, um, if you are having a racing heart, your, your beat is very fast, that could be something else Then you might need to get checked out. And so if you're having an irregular beat or you're having a very fast beat, you know, you should get that checked out because there could be other things going on as well that are sort of being uncovered now. Um, but there, there isn't anything in meat, you know, it's not like a stimulant or something like that that's going to make your heart race. Um, so um, just be mindful of that. But if it's, if it's, fast or irregular, then I would just get that checked out. Just talk to your doctor and get like an ECG, just to make sure EKG if you're in America and just make sure that, um, there aren't any issues there. And, um, okay. Hope that answers that. Oh, was that another one? 
So Linda asks, I'm thirsty all the time. I do electrolytes and salt, carnivore seven weeks. I drink water, bone broth, and mineral water. I almost can't stand any more water. Why is this? Um, well, if you're taking a whole bunch of electrolytes and salt, you're going to make yourself more thirsty. You're going to make your, you're going to increase your body's demand for water. And so it sounds like you're sort of getting into a, a bit of a, of a, of a catch 22 where you're, you're drinking, you're eating so much electrolytes, you're drinking so much water, and then you're, you're drinking so much water that you're sort of stuck and you don't like it anymore. And, um, and, and, uh, now you don't know what to do. So I would just, uh, I would just tame, pull it back on the electrolytes and salt. I don't, you know, I don't think you need to take a whole bunch of those things in. I don't really eat any salt at the moment. I'm actually trying to, to sort of a phase and just phasing out salt altogether. Uh, so I haven't eaten salt this whole week. Um, I'm fine. I don't get cramps. I don't have any problems with energy or, or hydration. And, uh, after that, just, um, you know, uh, I would drink to thirst though, but if you're, if you're eating a bunch of salt and, and electrolytes, you're, you're going to make yourself thirsty. You're going to make yourself more thirsty. As simple as that. So hair thinning growth advice, please. So I'm assuming that means, uh, that your hair is thinning and, um, you want to to know why? So most people, um, most people will, will their hair will be much better, much thicker, much stronger. Same with their skin and their nails, and everything else. And um, but there are some people that have some issues with hair loss. Um, most often, it is uh, from not eating enough and not eating enough fat. And so most people, when they 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 eat more, they realize that their body's actually asking for more, and they eat meat until it stops tasting good and they increase their fat, they find that 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 just goes away. Their hair starts becoming uh, much thicker, much, much more healthy. Um, I have, I have come across exactly two people that have uh, still had that issue um, even though they've been eating uh, enough fat and, and, and filling up or, or, you know, um, it seems like they are anyway. And, um, so there might be something else going on. If you, if you fit that category, I would su suggest getting it sort of a deep dive into your blood work and seeing if you're deficient in anything. Most people will not be deficient in anything. However, um, you might be. And so if you are, for whatever reason, it doesn't really matter. Just, you know, uh, you know, supplement or, or take something, uh, like if it's something that it can be in like organs or liver or something like that, and you just need a little more than, um, then you're getting just from, from, from muscle meat, then, then go for it. I, I don't have that problem. I've gotten my blood tests tested and, and everything and, um, never had an issue with that. Most people are in that category, but not everyone is. So, you know, if you're in that category and you need to supplement something, then, then that's okay. It's okay to supplement. Okay. So do wonder, don't men get really high ferritin on a line diet? Uh, not really. I mean, this is this is physiological. If you're eating physiologically, your body should work physiologically, and so you shouldn't have a problem. Um, and uh, so your body should work in the way it's supposed to. Also, you got to understand that that ferritin is also an acute phase reactant. So if you're sick or you're unwell, you have an inflammation or something like that, your ferritin can go up. And so sometimes people with high ferritin and go on a carnivore diet, this actually reduces their inflammation, their ferritin goes down. And so you know, even though they think, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of iron and heme iron and and uh, meat and uh, and there is, but. Um, but you're sort of in a, in a, a physiological state. You're in a, in a sort of inflammatory state when you're you're eating all this other garbage, and so um, you know that can normalize, and and uh, it often does. It usually does, you know. Mountain Wood Camp, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Really appreciate that. Um, so, gosh. Um, so Cindy asks, I'm in Canada, and they don't seem to check LDL but there is a non HDL cholesterol result. Uh, do you, do you know if that's the same thing? Um, yeah, I guess so. I don't know if they're including like triglycerides in that, uh, as well. Um, that's funny. I, I mean, I would imagine they would, I mean, can, I mean, they do, uh, generally. Um, but, uh, no, that's, that's very strange. I, w I honestly wouldn't worry about it. Like if your HDL is high and your triglycerides are low and you're not eating a bunch of carbs, sugar, smoking, all these sorts of things, like I just don't, I don't think that LDL is relevant unless it's just massively, massively elevated. Um, because you have this sort of U-shaped curve, your, your cholesterol goes too low 
death goes up precipitously, it gets way too high, and then you start seeing it go up as well. It's all epidemiological. But it, when it gets really, 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 really high, that's when you start seeing some problems. And, uh, and you know, too much of anything can, can disrupt uh, your system. But, um, um, but yeah, like my, my, H, my HDL is high, my triglycerides are low, and my LDL is mildly elevated as compared to, you know, what, what they think is, is a good range to be in, which I just don't, I don't agree with just because it's all based on uh, false data, frankly. Um, so Jared asks, for someone that works out regularly, would you say you have to increase how much you eat significantly? Absolutely. Um, you know, you're going to require more energy. You're going to require more protein uh, to, to build up your muscles and build up and, and maintain your musculature as well. Um, when I'm not eating as much as I need to, my weight goes down uh, even when I don't want it to. You know, I lose muscle mass. And... Um, and so you, you definitely need to eat to maintain your muscle mass. And you definitely need to uh, eat more in order to grow and uh, provide the energy you need to do that, those sorts of activities and run your muscles. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, going, you know, turning up the RPM on your car, you're going to be using more, more fuel. And that's just, that's just the same thing here. Um, and so I noticed that when I'm working out and I work out very heavily, when I do work out, when I get the chance to, um, I, I will double the amount of meat that I eat, not because, oh, I need to double it, but just because my body naturally does. And so my body's just like, I want more, I want more. So I, I've noticed that I tend to double the amount of meat that I, uh, that I eat or that I crave. And, uh, and when I do that, I, I stack on muscle, like no one's business. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like how, um, how much muscle you put on, uh, when you work hard and you just eat a ton of meat. It's pretty awesome. Um, so ZBZ asks, uh, my 14-year-old's slightly autistic, tried keto, and it helped a lot. Awesome. But he lost more weight than, I, uh, than I'd hoped for. How to gain some back? He doesn't do physical exercise much. Well, he doesn't necessarily need to do physical exercise. He just needs to eat enough, you know, because if you're, if you're not eating enough, your, your, your hunger sig signals are going to be very, very different if you go uh, keto, you stop eating carbs because carbohydrates uh, just screw with your hunger signals and make you eat when you're not hungry. And that's why we tend to overeat when we're eating carbohydrates and sugar. And there's, there's biochemical reasons for this that I go into in a lot of my talks. Um, and, uh, and so, um, that's the thing. So he's not going to be as hungry. He's not going to, his hunger signals are going to be much more subtle than, um, they would otherwise. And so you just need to just keep giving him meat and fatty meat. And uh, as long as it tastes good, he should just keep eating. He's not going to feel hungry in the traditional sense anymore. So you just need to sort of relearn your hunger signals and just recognize that when meat tastes good, that's positive feedback from your brain saying eat more. Okay. And so, uh, if he does that, I, I, he'll be fine. He'll, he'll be, you know, he's a 14 year old kid. He's going to be a growing boy. You just you need to, you just need to shovel meat into that kid and, uh, and he'll grow and he'll, he'll grow strong and he'll do great. Um, so someone asked how much am I eating a day? 500 grams? No, <laughs> no, usually at least a kilo, uh, of fatty meat, very fatty meat. If it's more lean, I'll tend to eat more. Um, and then if I'm, um, and if I'm working out, it'll be like easily two kilos, so like four pounds, four plus pounds of meat a day. Um, uh, very, a very fatty meat. Um, so Shelly says three months carnivore currently six weeks pregnant. Oh, congratulations. Doctors are very against carnivore. Yeah. I, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, my cholesterol LDL is 350 triglycerides are 80. Oh, HCL is 80, triglycerides are 48. Is this dangerous for the baby? No, I don't think so at all. And I think that, you know, um, people such as, uh, you know, Dr. Jamie Seaman, who's a, who's a uh, OBGYN, she does carnivore, she advocates carnivore. Um, and then Dr. Kiltz, who's also um, a fertility doctor, he does the same. And these are, these are people that, that do this, um, do this sort of diet and, and dietary recommendations with pregnant women every day. All right. And so just remember that biologically, physiologically, humans are carnivores and we have survived for millions of years. In fact, we've thrived in very harsh conditions for millions of years uh, as carnivores. And so for like 2 million years, 
you know, every single pregnant pregnancy was on a carnivore diet. So you are doing something biological. It's not going to be bad for your kid. Um, LDL, there's actually uh, studies that show that women who are pregnant and have higher LDL have much lower rates of kids with autism. Okay. So your brain is made out of fat. Your brain is made out of cholesterol. This stuff is good for you. Your HDL is very high. Your triglycerides are very low. Your HDL is going to be fine. Your H or your LDL is going to be fine. Your LDL is going to be very healthy and undamaged. That's a, you know, high HDL and low triglycerides are a marker that your LDL has not been damaged and oxidized and glycosylated. So I think you're doing, you're doing great. And I think your, your kid is going to really thrive, um, as a result of this and will have, will be able to develop to their genetic potential, which will be far better than any of their peers. So I think you're setting them up for life there. Um, and if you're concerned about that even more, then I would go take a look at Jamie Seaman's um, um, podcast as well as Dr. Kilts. Uh, they're both great and they have uh, a lot of good things to say exactly in this um, scenario with, with pregnancy and fertility. Um, so JMP, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Really appreciate that. Um, he asks, uh, lost 30 pounds in four months on this way of eating. Still had high blood pressure, added um, 4K salt and potassium. My blood pressure is now 120 over 78. Awesome. Very good job. Uh, but we've been told low salt for high blood pressure. Is this normal concerns? No, um, that's sort of been turned on its head. Um you know, there are very few people that are uh, salt sensitive and actually need to restrict salt, um, especially for like blood pressure and things like that. Um, you know, we, we have people that have like crazy high sodium in, in, in the hospital. Most people don't. Most people, it's very hard to get uh, hypernatremic, which is what high sodium is. Um, we, don't, we don't see these guys having just blasting high um, uh, blood pressure is really what, what causes a, a main, uh, a major cause of high blood pressure is again, uh, you know, high insulin, chronically high insulin, it causes insulin resistance and insulin actually has, uh, um, a role to play in the contractility of, and, uh, and relaxation of your, your arteries and, uh, and vascular vasculature. And so when that becomes insensitive to, uh, insulin, it just sort of stays solid and it won't dilate. Right. So that's going to, that's going to keep you as a high, at a high blood pressure, uh, because it won't be able to expand and, and uh, um, you know, uh, accommodate a, uh, a higher uh, volume. And so it's going to stay low, which is going to increase the pressure. And so, no, I think you're doing everything right. You know, you're, you're, you're I mean, it's the tail of the tape, right? You're, you, you, you're eating salt and your blood pressure is low. So your blood pressure was high. Now it's low. So whatever you're doing, it's fine. Um, you know, if they're telling, oh my God, you got to stop that. You got to stop that. Like why you, 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 you aren't causing the problem that they're saying that you're going to have. So maybe you're a special case, but maybe they're wrong as well. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, I, like I said, I don't really use much salt anymore. I've sort of wean that out. Um, and you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to use salt, but if you want to, it's clearly not causing a problem. So I think you're fine. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product, not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks guys. Um, so Karina asks, should we still take vitamin D supplements on top? Just to say in UK, uh, really feeling the impact of dark early nights and bad weather. Well, that yeah, you will in the UK. I think it was, I've just, it's so dark all the time. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, a I, you know, I'm a bit, uh, uh, curious about the whole vitamin D thing because, you know, I was talking to, to Paul Mason and, um, and, and we were talking about that and he thinks that, uh, actually you don't really need to take vitamin D that after a certain threshold, like vitamin D is a hormone and it's a very important for your body. It's very vital. It's very good for you. Um, but 
you only need so much of it. And so what he was saying is that after a certain point, you get diminishing returns and you don't really get uh, much benefit, right? It's not causing harm. You know, people that take tons of vitamin D and, uh, and don't cause harm. So, you know, I don't think, I don't think you're going to hurt yourself by supplementing with vitamin D, but, um, after a certain point, it seems that, uh, it may not actually be, be doing all that much for you, that it's more of an indicator of health as opposed to a, uh, a you know, something that causes good health after a certain point, right? You do need, uh, uh, vitamin D. Um, that's why it's a vitamin. And, um, so, you know, there's studies that Dr. Paul Mason was talking about where people that, you know, had high vitamin D levels just naturally, they were quite metabolically well. And so they thought this was a marker of metabolic health because when they had people that had lower uh, vitamin D and they supplemented up to that same level, they didn't actually see the same benefits. And so, you know, maybe it's a more subtle response. Maybe this is, is an indicator as well as being beneficial. It's, it's hard for me to say uh, because I haven't looked as, as closely into this stuff as he has, but I'm not, I'm not sold that you need to take any at all. You know, like, um, you know, we had our ancestors living in, in the Arctic uh, frost for, you know, all the ice ages and things like that. And you have the Eskimos and Inuits and the Nets and all these people living in the polar north. And, uh, and you know, they don't, they don't take any supplements, right? And uh, you, you get a lot of vitamin D from animal fat as well. So you, you'll probably actually have a pretty good vitamin D level. And I would bet that, you know, being on a carnivore diet, being metabolically healthy, you're going to be pretty good and your, your, your vitamin D levels will be fine. Um, and so I'm, I'm not convinced on the whole necessity for vitamin D if you have passed a certain threshold. Um, and then Marnie says, my hair has stopped falling out, which is awesome. Fantastic. Very well done. That's usually what we see. And then uh, the people that, you know, are still experiencing that on carnivore generally aren't eating enough or not eating enough fat. That's what that's what I tend to see. Um, Gigi asks, uh, says that she's epileptic and neuro <laughs> neurologist freaks when I say keto, uh, ALT, AST, and high and total high cholesterol, high, high, high. Um, well, you're... Well, I don't know how long you've been doing uh, carnivore or keto. Um, your ALT and AST can be elevated for a number of reasons and could have been elevated previously. Um, and cholesterol, total cholesterol, you know, not too worried about that. Depends on what the breakdown is. Um, depends on, again, what you're eating, if you're smoking, if you're drinking, if you're eating sugar and carbs. And, um, you know, if you have high or low LDL, high or low triglycerides as well. So that's um, not necessarily a bad thing. If your HDL is high and your triglycerides are low, I wouldn't really care about total cholesterol. Um, but um, um, but yeah, the ALT and AST, that, that should normalize on a carnivore diet. Uh, that's really funny and uh, a little upsetting that uh, uh, your neurologist uh, freaks out when you say uh, keto. I mean, this is one of the more uh, established facts in, in, uh, neurology and neurobiology is that, uh, being in ketosis really helps suppress, um, uh, seizures. Or maybe if you think about it this way, things that were supposed to be in ketosis pretty much all the time, that not being in ketosis, eating carbohydrates, eating the things that kick you out of ketosis are actually triggering, uh, seizures and epilepsy, which I think is actually a, a more accurate way of looking at it. Um, that is a well-established fact. I mean, we, we literally have a hundred years of data, clinical trials, randomized control trials, and, um, and then just, you know, you know, uh, uh, stage four trials of just people out in the community using it. This was the only treatment that we had, right? For centuries, the only thing that you could do for people with epilepsy was, was fast, fast them. They, they just, you know, they eat, they, they would, um, have uh, epilepsy, epileptic fits. Uh, and then, it sort of came up with a, a ketogenic diet because they found that, hey, you know, if you didn't eat carbs, you just sort of focused on meat, that actually this would get you the same result as fasting. And so they got into that and that's how that developed as a, as a diet. And so that bothers me, you know, because A, they should damn well know that. And B, you know, if they know that, they shouldn't be trying to, trying to dissuade you away from it right? The whole reason that we sort of moved to um, pharmacological methods was because people are saying it's too hard to get people to change their life and to change their diet. 
um, it's, it's easier just to give them a pill, right? Okay, but you've already said, hey, I, I want to do this myself. And you're, oh my God, don't do it. What the hell is that about? You know, like you were, you know, the, the argument was give them pills because we can't convince them to eat to eat a ketogenic diet and stop eating carbohydrates. So why, why are you, why are you trying to convince someone to eat carbohydrates? Um, one, one idiot that I heard, uh, on this subject said, well, if you, you know, you don't want to go on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet because yeah, it'll stop seizures. But as soon as you, you come off of the ketogenic diet, you'll, you'll get seizures again. It's like, okay, idiot. Well, you've just taken them off ketogenic diet. So now they're going to get seizures again. Good job. Uh, and, and in fact, that's actually wrong. You know, the studies actually are very clear that, um, the longer you're in ketosis, the longer you're on a ketogenic diet, the longer you're on a, you know, carnivore diet, um, you know, there's no studies looking at carnivore diet, but just ketogenic diet, which a carnivore diet is, um, that is actually provides more protection and lasting benefit, you know? So when you, when you're on a keto diet for like a year, you're less likely to have seizures after, even after you come off. Okay. So that's wrong. And that guy needs to either quit or read a damn journal in his own field. That really just bugs the crap out of me. I was talking to professor, um, Thomas Seafried, you know, who's a cancer biology expert. Um, uh, when he was, uh, uh, teaching uh, neurobiology at Yale, he did his postdoc there. And then he was, uh, I think he was like an associate professor there teaching neurobiology and, and his research was in ketosis and epilepsy. And he was furthering this on. And, and at the time, you know, his department just said, oh, you know, don't worry about that. We have such good pharmacologicals. You know, we just, yeah, just, just focus on that. That's easier. Just give him a pill. And of course, this is all industry driven, right? So this is just like, oh yeah, give a pill, give a pill. This is so great. Um, and, and it's, uh, and it's garbage. And now, so not only, um, have we said like, ah, you know, let's just be lazy now. Now, you know, we're so tied up in this that you were actually telling people not to go and do something that. We're literally stop seizures in 50% of people like, and, and it re significantly reduces them and everyone else. Like what the hell? Sorry. I, it just always pisses me off when, when I hear that, uh, someone's doing that. So Sean, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Um, yes, he has bowel motions every day or every seven to 10 days, no pain, eating a lot of ribeyes and taking magnesium hard stools. Um, so the seven to 10, 10 days thing, that's fine. You know, it's, it's, it's okay because you're going to be absorbing, you know, 98, 99% of the meat that you eat if you're not eating fiber and all that stuff. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. The thing is, is that, um, if it's hard stools, then you could probably do with more fat and that's really the only thing. And, but if it's not painful and you don't, and it's not a problem, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it. When you're eating fat, your body can only absorb a certain amount of it. Then it spills over and you excrete it. And so uh, that's what keeps your stool soft is that excess fat. And so if you're getting really dry, hard stools and it becomes painful and, you know, rocky looking and stuff like that, then you're really not eating enough fat. Your body's absorbing every ounce of fat. You just need to up your fat. And um, I don't think you necessarily need to take magnesium, but if you want to, that's fine. But uh, really what you want to do if you want to if you want to soften up your stools is eat more fat. I know you're eating ribeyes. Ribeyes are great, but obviously your body wants um, wants a lot of fat. So um, you can try increasing your fat, and that should soften things up. Um, Shiva TK, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, Dr. Chafee, the man. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Um, it's awesome. And um, Okay. Let's see. So question, I'm 60 years old on 17 prescriptions, 200 pounds. My BMI is 36. Started keto three weeks ago, lost 12 pounds. Great job. Uh, I informed my primary care provider. I volunteered to stop uh, statin and second uh, blood pressure, Losartan. Um, still on uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Um, well, that's awesome. Uh, very well done. And 17 prescriptions, that is that is what we call a prescription cascade. When you're on so many medications, you're on a lot of medications for a lot of different things, and then they start building up the side effects, and you start taking medications for those side effects, and then the medications for the side effects of the, of the medications you're taking for the side effects, and so on. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty wild. So well done, for you for, uh, you know, taking control of your health and trying to get healthy again and get off these medications because that's, that's really what it's about. And that's what, uh, you know, medicine should be about and healthcare should be about 
is um, is getting people healthy and not having to uh, rely on these medications. Medications are great when they're necessary. I don't think there is. I don't think you just take medications so that you can just do a lot of unhealthy things. I think that's a bad way of doing things. You know, like. Um, you know, if you're going to smoke and drink and do drugs and like, Hey, there's this pill that mitigates that awesome. I can drink more. I can smoke more. I can do more drugs. Well, I think you're, you're sort of not really helping yourself, right? Because maybe, yeah, there's this medication that can maybe help deal with all the, all the problems that you had, uh, as a, as a result of these bad, bad actions, but like, you're much better off if you just don't, uh, do those bad actions in the first place and then you don't damage your body. So, uh, very well done. Uh, keep it up. Um, you know, keto is great. Uh, make sure you focus on meat, focus on fatty meat. Um, if you're going to eat, uh, vegetables, uh, God forbid, then, uh, just, you know, just make sure a, that they're not, they don't have a bunch of carbs and sugar, obviously in keto. Um, and then avoid nightshades, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, capsicums. Um, I would stay away from those and any sort of seeds, seeds, beans, nuts, uh, those sorts of things, I would just, I would just steer very clear away from. Um, those are where you have a higher preponderance of uh, defense chemicals. Okay, and you can treat them, you can heat them, you can do all these sorts of things that that will um, denature and mitigate uh, these sorts of things, but they won't necessarily get rid of them completely or or make them entirely safe. So just be mindful of that. And um, yeah, just meat first, and then switch up the 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 veggies that you're eating because if you're if you're just eating the same thing you're just eating spinach all day every day your body sort of gets worn out and overwhelmed trying to break down all the and detoxify all the stuff that's coming in from spinach so you need to sort of eat small amounts of it and switch it up you know and if i were to ever eat a plant that's it that is what i would do i don't plan on it unless i'm dying of starvation but you know uh, if you choose to for whatever strange reason then that that's the way i would do it um, awesome. Oh, geez. Oh, thank you very much, uh, for the super chat fool. Uh, it was very kind of you. Um, it says I am doing one meal a day along with exercise, uh, during my fasting window. Um, great. I eat four or five eggs along with butter, ghee and fried meat because I get lean meat here. Uh, I mean, doing everything great. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing everything great. Um, you're just, I mean, it's great that you're, you're trying to get uh, the fat in and, and you're putting that on. That's awesome. I would go by how you feel, how your energy is, how your hair and your skin and everything like that is going. And um, and then uh, um, and then I would, uh, you know, just make sure, yeah, that you're eating enough that you feel good and that your stools are uh, you know, just soft and normal consistency, because that, that means that you're getting enough fat and then some, so the some is spilling over and getting out and keeping your stool soft and that will keep, uh, everything, uh, everything going well. And, uh, and then, yeah, you're just working out and just make sure you're eating enough. You're working out a lot. You may need to eat more than once a day. So you're, you're doing once a day. I, I normally eat once a day, but not when I'm working out, when I'm working out, I tend to want to I need to eat more. And so I, I tend to get, uh, more, uh, I will eat like twice a day at that point. So uh, just make sure you're getting enough. That's the main thing. Okay. Oh, oh, just sort of, everything just skips around a bit. And Carney Cave Girl, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, So please say hi to Andrew Huberman, who is on IG. Oh, is he? I did not know that. No way. Well, he doesn't have any requests to join. If other people have requests to join, I don't know who they are, though. If Andrew Huberman's on here, that's amazing. That uh, that'd be a very interesting guy to talk to. Uh, what is going on here? Sorry. Oh. Jesus. There we go. Um, so that was from Olivia who said that. Olivia, can you please let me give me an update on did I, did I scare away Andrew Huberman? I don't know. Um I don't know. 
trying to get down here. Well, if if you're still here, uh, Dr. Huberman, thank you very much for joining us. That's, that's awesome. Absolutely love to uh, to chat with you. And if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to join the live and, and have a chat, that would be awesome. Just uh, let me know. Yeah, he said he was going to try and document his blood work. Yep, Huberman on, matey. No kidding. Well, that's amazing. He didn't request to join. Okay, so I don't know how to join him. Please say hi to Andrew Huberman, who is on IG and wants to connect regarding carnivore. Okay, well, I don't know if that means that he wanted to to join the live, um, but if he does, uh, absolutely happy to. Um, and uh, and otherwise, we love to chat um, sometime one on one or or on uh, each other's respective uh, platforms. That would be awesome. So, hello, nice to meet you. Um, do I eat raw eggs? I have eaten raw eggs. I've uh, sort of used that as sort of like a protein drink where I'll just sort of crack like 10 eggs into a glass and sort of mix them up and sort of break up the yolks and then just drink them. It just tastes like cold uh, scrambled eggs. It's actually okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, for me anyway, some people do have a problem with egg whites and um, I would uh, just just be mindful of that. And so if, if that's something, if, if you're in that category and you have a bit of an issue with that, then I would just, um, I would just, uh, uh, avoid it. If that's, if that's you. Okay. Um, so Jonathan has a question. If we can't afford grass finished meat, uh, do we need to, uh, be worried long-term about antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, et cetera, um, which might uh, be used on or around the livestock. No, I, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, in, in generally, uh, I think that you can, um, you know, unless you're like in just some area that just has just you know, really, really bad uh, habits and safety standards and things like that. But I, I tend to just eat, you know, Costco meat. Um, you know, I definitely preferred, um, having like, I bought, bought a grass fed cow that was like 10 years old and it just tasted amazing. It had much more flavor, much more beefy flavor. And, uh, and that was great. And I felt great on that. Um, but at the moment, like mostly what I eat is, uh, is just, is just, uh, uh, you know, normal grain finished beef. So when you look at antibiotics, antibiotics are, are they tend to be given, I mean, you know, people don't spend money, you know, just, just for the fun of it. Right. So generally you see like in, in all, cows are in like huge herds in big area and they, they, you know, have to keep these things, you know, healthy and they don't want to get them sick. You know, that, that is our responsibility as well to take care of these animals. And so when you have just tons and tons and tons of animals, um, you know, th they could get sick and then you have half of these things die or, or be very, very hurt by that. And so they found that it's, it's, uh, you know, more effective and safer for the cows to sort of give them, uh, antibiotics in those conditions, but not everyone needs that. You know, if you're not in feedlots, you're just sort of out in, in pasture and things like that, you probably don't need that. Um, and then the hormones to grow, those are generally given at the beginning so that you, uh, grow. Right. And so a lot of them are out of the system by then. But there was um, uh, there was an article I read. There's actually when you put this stuff in context, it's, it's very different. So if you have um, if you have uh, three ounces of of no normal meat, not hormone treated, uh, it has about two ounces or sorry, two nanograms of estrogen in it. Right. And then um, and then uh, hormone treated cows will have 3.9 nanograms. Okay. So that's doubling. And that's what people say. I'm like, my God, it doubles. And that's true. It technically uh, does double. However, you know, a birth control pill, depending on the brand can have like as much as 35,000 nanograms, right? So, so going up by 1.9 nanograms is probably not that big of a deal. Um, pregnant or, or, or fertile women will have, you know, over a hundred thousand nanograms a day that they will produce and soy will have phytoestrogens, uh, that can mimic estrogen in your body will have over a million nanograms of that. And so, you know, you put it in context, right? Um, and so I don't think, I don't think it's that, that big of a deal. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, if you can get grass fed and all that sort of stuff, then I think that that's, 
probably better, but I think of it sort of as, as sort of getting you know, gold and silver in the Olympics, right? So silver medal lost to gold, right? But the silver medal has also beat everyone else on earth, right? And so, you know, the, the grain finished cows, first of all, 80% of their life is on grass. And then they just the last couple of months in a feedlot. Okay. Not ideal, but, uh, is what it is. And it's still better than, than a lot of other things. Almost everything else you'll eat as well. Um, so Thule is, uh, asking again, uh, thank you again for the super chat. It's very kind of you. Uh, what is your take on seafood like sardines and squid on a carnivore diet? I think it's perfectly fine. If that's something that, that you like and you tolerate, uh, I I'll eat squid or octopus. I love, I like both. Um, obviously I'm not frying it in any sort of seed oil. I'm not breading it or anything like that, where you can make sort of like, like a panko breading, uh, from, uh, pork rinds though, actually. So that's something I'll, I'll want to try. Um, but no, they're great. And, you know, a good source of, uh, you know, like calcium and, and bones with the, the sardines because you're getting, getting the skeleton in there as well. And, uh, yeah, no, those are fine. I think any, any meat that you enjoy makes you feel good. Um, and that doesn't give you some sort of, you know, weird sort of, um, intolerance, I think is, I think is totally fine. So whatever, whatever feels good for you. Um, okay. So, uh, hello, Dr. Anthony, what is your thoughts on eating only meat while doing one meal a day and every Monday, no meal at all. Uh, but in the weekend eating some potatoes with meat, that's a very, very specific question. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, but look, if that works for you, then that's fine. I mean, you know, potatoes, obviously carbs, you're going to sort of, uh, kick yourself out of ketosis. Um, which is, you know, is what it is. Is and that's fine. If you, if you want that, then that's fine. Uh, potatoes. I think I think you could you could pick a better carb, honestly. Um, and so, you know, it's um, you know it's a nightshade, right? And so it's just going to have you know solanine and other things. You know, so if you're going to eat it, you know, obviously you know uh, cook it. I mean, who the hell eats these things raw? But um, you know, peel it as well. A lot of this stuff is you know barrier protection on the skin. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I would I would avoid potatoes myself. I think there are other carbohydrates you can that you can do that uh, uh, will be better than that. And um, you know the the golden era bodybuilders like Yoranda uh, would actually have one meal a, a week that they would they would just eat steak and eggs throughout the week, and then like on Sundays they just eat like a you know uh, they would they would uh, eat carbs and things like that as well, and they felt that that help build up their glycogen and they'd have better workouts at the beginning of the week. I personally think that they're, they're sort of shooting themselves in the foot um, and they never really you know, kept themselves keto or, you know, you know, keto adapted. And so that they were constantly replenishing their blood sugar and glycogen because like when I work out now, uh, I can just go and go and go and go and go because I'm constantly mobilizing my fat store. So I never run out of glycogen. I never run out of blood sugar, you know, so they were, you know, they're, they're well, you know, so if you need to carbo load, you're, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. I think, I think that you're, you're just sort of slowing yourself down. Um, so yeah, Let's see another question. <laughs> Um, do you think carb in any amount is needed from female with Hashimoto's? Uh, well, I don't think you need carbohydrates. I think that that's, um, you know, something that's, that's pretty well established. I mean, there's, there's several inter international medical bodies that just say flat out, you know, the, the, the amount of carbohydrates that person needs throughout their life, uh, is zero. You know, you, you make your own I mean, you need carbohydrates, obviously, but you make them and you make the ones that you need. And so you make blood sugar, you make liver glycogen. And, uh, and so you don't need to take in exogenous, uh, mm -hmm. carbohydrates. Um, whether this affects Hashimoto's or not, I'm, I, I wouldn't know that for sure, but I do see people with Hashimoto's. I have probably a couple dozen patients with Hashimoto's at the moment. And, um, and they've been able to go on a carnivore diet and, they do very, very well on that and their, uh, their numbers improve and their, um, uh, and their antibody levels come down as well. It's, it's Hashimoto's is a longer one. It, it takes longer to sort of, you know, un, undo that knot. Um, and so you have people over a year, year and a half before things really start selling down completely, but it's, it, it improves steadily the whole time. Um, as far as carbohydrates expect, expecting that, uh, affecting that specifically, I'm not, uh, too sure, but, 
I would, um, you don't need it. I don't, definitely don't need it. Oh, I missed one of them. Um, so hello, your videos have helped me. Good. Very glad. Very glad to hear that. Seven weeks ago, I started carnivore after watching your why we are carnivores video and it helped me fix my thyroid issues. Awesome. That's very good to hear. Um, I'd like to give more details, but 200 character limit. Okay. That's it. Well, I'm very glad to hear that you're, that you're doing better. I'm very glad to hear that, 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 that helped you. Um, and so very well done for, for doing that and taking control of your, of your health. I think that's, that's really great. Um, Stephanie says, hi, 55 years old female here eating mainly ketovore with some fermented veggies, uh, like sauerkraut for the last three years. Oh, great. Um, had three gout attacks this year and uh, uric acid level around seven. Any suggestions? Um, well, uh, Ken Berry has uh, more uh, information on this than than I do. I haven't, I haven't um, looked into the, the exact ins and outs of, of this. I do know that, you know, going back to like, you know, Dr. Salisbury, J. J. Salisbury in the 1800s, uh, they were finding that they were reversing people's gout by putting them on a pure red meat and water diet. And that's certainly something that you see people talking about now uh, on the different forums and just, just messaging me and things like that. They've, I've seen that a number of times. Uh, I don't know if it's the the sauerkraut that's triggering it off. Something is. Um, and so I, I think that would be my first port of call is, is just cutting out everything besides uh, meat and water and then, and then going from there. And then, um, but uh, Dr. Barry, uh, Ken Berry has a lot of videos on, on gout and, uh, and diet as well. That, uh, would be useful to you here as well. Okay. Okay. So Davinio asks, how should I gain weight on the carnivore diet? Um, thanks for your enthusiasm. No problem. Um, so how do you gain weight? Well, you gain weight by stimulating your muscles to grow, right? So you need to exercise, you need to uh, you know, focus on, on resistance uh, exercise and uh, and then feed your body and give your body enough uh, a fuel to grow and, and to, um, uh, to get bigger and stronger. So if you're working out hard and you're lifting weights and, um, and then you're eating enough and you're, and you're eating until meat stops tasting good and you know you're still getting that positive feedback from the meat that you're eating and you get to the point where you're just like Ugh, not really liking this anymore you can safely say your body has what it wants and um and at that point you will you will find that you'll actually gain uh muscle quite easily um so i that that is what i would do is just just work out and uh and and make sure that your body's getting enough uh one second Okay, so sorry, I'm just trying to find some of these. Um, I'm trying to pick through some of these things that are comments or questions, so I have to read them real quickly. Sorry about that. Mountain Wood is saying, oh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, can I join my SC question not seen? Um, SC question? You can ask your question here anyway. Um, ask it up. Uh, now I'll keep an eye out for it. Sometimes I have to sort of scroll back and things like that so I don't see them coming through. But if you ask your question here, um, then please, please do. And I'm happy to, to answer your question, whatever it is. So do I need to eat raw in order to get the water soluble vitamins? No, I don't think so. There's plenty of people that don't, don't eat raw. I mean, I, I, I like less cooked. The more I do this, I sort of like the less uh, cooked to sort of sear it on the outside. I've eaten raw meat, but it's more of a, of a patience thing. I sort of like, don't want to, don't want to, uh, 
you know, sort of spend time cooking. And so I just, uh, to start, you know, getting patient and just start eating a bit. But, um, no, I don't think you, I don't think you need to eat that. No. Um, so well, thank you again, uh, very much. Um, saying I'm currently doing animal based one meal a day diet. Since I don't want to miss out on exercise while intermittent fasting, what fasting pattern do you suggest when working out? Well, when I, when I'm training, um, and when I was, when I was playing, um, I just wouldn't eat before I, well, before I worked out. Um, certainly wouldn't, I would, certainly I would never eat, uh, before games just ever, just, you know, throughout the whole day, I would never do that. Um, but you know, I might eat sort of earlier in the day if I'm just having tr practice or training, I'll eat sort of like early in the day, but I like literally like five hours, I would, you know, have like a big, big gap in between, uh, training session, uh, between eating and training sessions. So, yeah, so I would, I would, uh, I feel better when I'm, when I work, when I eat after I work out, it depends on when you're, when you're working out and if you if your body really wants like two meals a day, if you're working out in the morning, then that's great. You just eat after you, you work out and then you eat again later at night. Otherwise you might want to, uh, you know, eat at night after you, after you work out and after you train. And then in the morning you might still be hungry. Your body might say like, Hey, you know, we want some more of this. And so just, just eat there. But I, I would, I tend to feel better when I don't fill up during the day because you just, you know, your body's still just wanting a little bit more. So it still has a bit of, um, you know, just has a bit, bit, I just have feel a bit more energy when I, when I eat, uh, until I'm full, I, I get quite uh, lethargic. And I think that is just going into like a rest and digest mode. Your body's saying, Hey, calm down. Let's conserve our energy. You've just gone out. You've made your kill. You've got your food and now settle it down. We don't want to waste energy. And so, um, I would just, uh, take it easy there and, um, uh, try not to fill up completely during the day and then just try to eat after your, after your workouts. I think that's, that's been the best for me, um, from what I've noticed from, you know, from training and eating, uh, this way for a number of years and just my, my entire athletic career. I've always, I've always noticed that, that it's always better to eat after, after you work out. Um, see. I live with my 24 year old daughter who eats a sad diet. I'm so tempted, especially uh, with my favorite candy. Uh, does anyone have any ideas to help me with these intense cravings? I'm a newbie to keto lost 12 pounds. Well, that's great. Um, look, you know, sugar is a drug and, um, you know, you're going to be dealing with, with cravings uh, for a while, but those cravings go away just like any other drug. And, and then it's just habit and remembering like, oh, that was nice. But, um, you know, you can relearn your patterns. You can relearn your habits. You can, you can get, um, away from these sorts of things. And so that is what I would do. It's easier when someone's not in the house and, and sort of tempting you with that, uh, at the whole time, but it's, uh, it's something that you can do. And, uh, and the longer you do it, the longer you'll be able to do it. And if you slip up, just get right back on the horse get right back, um, to what you were doing before. And, uh, and you know, don't, don't let that derail you. You know, a lot of people will, maybe they'll slip up and they go, well, I guess it's, that's, that's it for me. It's just, I, I wasn't able to do it. Uh, well, you know, people slip up, you know, to errors to human is human. Um, but you can, you can, you know, you can fix it and you can sort of get back going again. So, you know, just because you slip up doesn't mean you're out of the club. You know, you, you don't have to, uh, uh, go back to all those ways, but the longer you go without this stuff, the the less you'll miss it. You know, I don't, I don't, I, I used to have a, you know, I loved like gummy candies and things like that. I tended not to eat too much just because I was always, you know, athletic and, and wanted to, um, you know, just put good things in my body and, um, sugar was not one of them, but I really like candy. I really liked like gummy candies and I, I don't miss them. I don't miss them at all. You know, I look at them sometime and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that was good. That would have been nice. But you know, not don't care. I, I, w I would rather feel like a superhero 24 seven than eat something nummy. Sometimes I, I just, that's just a no brainer for me. Um, let's see. So, so I so said, thank you, Julie, um, for your super chat. I really appreciate that. Um, Julie says I'm strictly carnivore, but miss and enjoy flavored drinks. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I do herbal teas with heavy whipping cream and stevia, uh, or energy drinks or flavored water sweetened with sucralose? I mean, you can, you can, you're an adult, you could do whatever you want, but, 
Uh, I wouldn't. I don't think that that's going to be a good idea. I mean, herbal teas, you know, it's just going to be, it's just going to be a plant. It's going to have some things that are in plants. And, you know, some people, uh, you know, have a bit of a problem with that. Some people don't really care uh, to see if that works for you. Stevia, I would, I, I wouldn't personally, just because those artificial sweeteners, I think cause a problem. Uh, I see a lot of people that have a lot of difficulty getting off of artificial sweeteners. They actually feel like they're getting like withdrawals. They feel pretty rotten. And there's tons of oxalates in stevia as well. Um, and uh, it's just, and you're also keeping your, your brain, uh, you know, addicted. You're, 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 um, you're just sort of remembering that sweet taste and you're going and chasing it. And, you, and right now you're saying, I really miss these flavored drinks. That's because you're still, you know, thinking about them. You're still sort of using them and you, you eventually they'll go away. You know, you won't care anymore. And so I think that's the best thing to do. Sucralose, definitely I would avoid those uh, sugar alcohols are pretty nasty for you and they cause horrible things to happen to your, <laughs> to your, <laughs> to your gut. And, and, um, and they, uh, uh, yeah, so you'll, you'll get, uh, you know, you'll sort of promote, uh, you know, gut bacteria that you don't really want and you'll get like horrendous gas and it's also a laxative. So it's like, it does a lot of stuff to you that you, you probably don't want to do. So I would avoid that. I think you're, you're doing really, really well. Um, and so, you know, this is just, this is just one last thing and, and, you know, you can just, you know, just stay away from it. The longer you stay away from it, the less you'll want it. But you're doing really well. Um, I just just keep going as you are. You're doing great. Um, so Mountain Wood Camp says, "How do you air cure without salt in the fridge?" So it's the same thing. I just I just put it up there um, on the drying racks. And it's not touching anything, and um, and um, and it just dries out. And, you know, without the salt, you know, it, it does taste a bit bland at the moment, but, um, from, from people that I've spoken to who've done this and haven't eaten salt in, you know, decades, uh, that, that goes away. So I'm, I'm waiting to see that. I'm waiting to see if it sort of goes away and see how it goes. Um, but, uh, yeah, but it, you can still do this whole drying thing. So I still do the drying thing. I still have my meat sort of cut up and stacked, uh, and sort of placed on drying racks. And, um, and so it's not, um, uh, that's not a, that's not an issue. It'll still, it'll still sort of dry out and, and that concentrates the flavor and browns better as well. Uh, so that, that still happens. Oof. Okay. So could you speak on traumatic brain injury? My brother has severe diffuse axonal, uh, traumatic brain injury to the frontal lobe. I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, that's a, that's a devastating injury. Unfortunately with acute axon, uh, with, um, diffuse axonal injuries, um, you know, this is, this is damaging the, the white matter tracks, which, um, are important and like damaging a small amount of that has, has a much greater effect than, than just the gray matter. Um, when you get like a fall or an accident and your head comes forward and then stops suddenly, you can, you can get those sort of shear forces that can sort of tear those white matter tracks. <clears throat> you can recover somewhat from these things. <clears throat> but they're devastating injuries. And, um, so depending on, on how extensive his injuries are, um, you know, there's, there's going to be some permanent damage and, and I don't know how, how injured he is and I don't know how extensive his injuries are. And so I don't know, uh, how much of that is going to heal. Um, but it uh, it can be quite bad. Um, so it's just only time will tell. Uh, but, uh, as far as TBIs are concerned, um, you know, there are studies that have come out, uh, showing that being in ketosis is actually neuroprotective actually helps, uh, uh, heal your brain after, uh, TBI. Um, ketones are quite good, uh, for your body in general and, uh, for your brain in particular. And so that is just one of the one of the many uh, things that have been coming out that uh, uh, of, of the benefits of being in ketosis. And then I think at the end of the day, if you're just doing whatever's physiological, um, you're giving your body what it needs, what it's, what it's, um, uh, what it's designed to have, which are your biologically appropriate species specific diet, your body's going to be uh, most apt and able to, um, uh, you know, it's just going to, it's going to run as well as it can. And so you're going to give your body all of the tools and ingredients that it needs to, 
you know, build, repair, and maintain your body and your brain. And uh, not least of all uh, is, uh, not least of which is, is fat and cholesterol. So I'm very sorry to hear about your brother. I, I wish him the very best. And I, I hope that that helps. Okay. Give us a on. Sorry, I just have to. What type of butter do I recommend? Um, well, whatever, whatever tastes good, really. Like, but grass-fed butter, you know, and, and stuff that doesn't have a bunch of like additives and things like that. I would definitely not have anything um, with any additives. And so, yeah, just grass-fed butter, if that works for you. Some people don't tolerate butter very well, just the dairy and the and the uh, um, you know milk proteins. But uh, if you do, then that's great. Now just go for grass-fed. <laughs> Uh, what do I think of uh, matcha tea? I think it's very bitter, and uh, so it's not something that I uh, drank much anyway. But you know, I think I think that that bitter taste is you know your brain and your tongue, which are sophisticated machines, they're telling you that there's something in there that is probably not good for you, and so mm -hmm. it's, it's giving you a warning, saying, "Hey, don't eat this, spit this out. This isn't good for us." And so I think a very bitter taste is probably a warning that there's there's stuff in there that you don't want. <laughs> Um, saying thyroid is fixed, still working on low blood count. No idea uh, what to improve. Uh, well, that's great. Well, good job on, on sorting out your thyroid. That's awesome. And Dale, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, says cheers for everything. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Question. I have so much to learn. I had no idea plants are poison. <laughs> what? Uh, where can I learn uh, more from credible sources? Uh, botany. Just study botany. Is then horticulture. Like their their entire library is full of this. You know. I mean, think about this. You get lost in the woods. You run out of food. You know, you can't just eat any random plant, right? Most of them will make you very, very sick or even kill you. Okay, why is that? That's because their uh, innate defense. One of their innate defenses is uh, making these you know, chemicals that are harmful to animals and insects trying to eat them. And so that's how they survive and thrive, you know? So, you know, one of the one of early things I learned in biology, I think you know, literally in seventh grade, was uh, that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous, so less and less animals can eat them uh, so that they can survive and thrive. And then um, animals becoming more and more adapted to specific uh, poisons and specific plants so that they can survive and thrive. And uh, so they have this sort of game that they play and, and, uh, and they just go up the ranks. Um, so it's not that, that certain plants are more poisonous or less poisonous. It's that we have more or less defenses to those poisons, you know? So, I mean, like spinach and kale, broccoli, all these things, we can, we can handle that pretty well, actually. Um, and, uh, and probably live our whole life eating this stuff, but you know, it, it is going to have stuff that we have to detox and can build up and can cause little problems here and there and can add up with a whole bunch of other things. Um, but you know, you have some hemlock that'll just kill you, you know, because we don't, we don't have really any protections against that. And they have uh, a, a toxin that will bind to your GABA receptors in your brain and you'll get intractable seizures and you will die uh, within one or two minutes. You cannot stop these things. And so it's, um, you know, it, it's just a common well, it's just a, it's just a universal uh, aspect of plants is that they use uh, chemical defenses, right? Every every living thing has a plant has a has a uh, defense, right? Down to single celled organisms, every everything's trying to eat everything else, right? And so while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't, and so they have to use other other means and other defenses. And one of those is is by being poisonous, being physically poisonous. Some animals use poison as well. You know, there's a bunch of, you know, frogs and toads that have bright colors or, or insects that have bright colors that say, Hey, don't eat me. I will, you know, you'll die. If you eat me, you know, we'll both go down. And so, uh, you know, these things have to sort of use these defenses. So, uh, that's why, and, and you can just, yeah, you know, study botany and horticulture. Um, professor Bruce Ames, uh, uh, published a paper in, uh, he's a he's a professor at UC Berkeley, and he published in 1989 um, 
looking at the levels of toxins in plants and comparing them to the amount of pesticides that we sprayed on them because they were trying to like ban pesticides. And so he did this study and actually showed that there were 10,000 times more naturally occurring pesticides in the plants and vegetables themselves than the uh, pesticides were, they were spraying on them by weight and that the naturally occurring toxins were actually far more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides they were spraying on them in animal models. In this case, ALAR is what they looked at. Um, the WHO has has an entire uh, you know web page talking about natural plant toxins or, or just natural toxins in food. Really, they don't even say they don't even say it's plant toxins. But you'll notice that every single thing in there is a plant. So these are all naturally occurring uh, plant toxins or, or algae that then get into seafood and then we eat the seafood and we get problems from from that. But um, but that's not the seafood's fault. That's the, the algae's fault, right? So you can look at those. Um, I have my um, my video that I did for low carb down under um, called "Plants Are Trying to Kill You." Uh, the very at the very end of that, there's a slide. You can pause it on there. There's a huge bibliography of resources that you can look at uh, for that. And then also, I have a a video by the same name, "Plants Are Trying to Kill You," on my YouTube channel um, that I sort of talk. I cover most of the same things, a lot of the same things, but not in as succinct and, uh, um, you know, uh, pattern sort of a way. And, uh, and I have a lot of, uh, a lot of references in there as well. And you can take a look at those, uh, as well, but literally any, any book on, on, um, uh, horticulture or, or, um, or botany will, will tell you this sort of things. I will, sh there was actually a couple of books as well. So yeah, there's a, there's a couple of books that we'll talk about like the different, you know, toxic plants. So, um, there's a book called plants that kill a natural history of the world's most poisonous plants. Um, 2018, Elizabeth, uh, Dauncey and Sonny Larson. And then there's another book called toxic plants of North America. Um, and those are just two of the ones obviously looking at, at just the, really the more nasty of these creatures, but they're, th those are the ones we don't eat anyway. But you know, the WHO, uh, website uh, is just talking about the ones that we do eat, right? Um, and so, you know, you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to eat certain plants without preparing them properly. You have to, you have to prepare them, you know, like cassava root, you know, this has tons of cyanide in it. And, uh, and if you don't prepare it properly, it can, for the bitter cassava, it can kill you. And even like, you know, low grade, uh, long-term cyanide poisoning, uh, can cause serious thyroid and, and um, neurological issues, uh, especially if you're not getting enough protein. And a lot of these people who rely on cassava are in these sort of more impoverished areas. It was more difficult to get uh, protein and uh, and fats and things like that. And so, you know, like 500 million people, their primary source of calories is from cassava, and uh, it's the third most important source of calories in the in the, uh, tropical regions. And it will kill you if you don't prepare it properly. And there's a lot of these things, you know, and it talks about talks about a lot of them. Um, so Julie, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, she asks, want to lose 50 pounds of fat on carnivore. What kind of exercise program is best? Uh, days per week, length of workout. I lift heavy, but I'm open to recommendations. I think I think lifting is uh, quite good. You know, you build your muscles. You're going to expand energy. You're going to trigger your body to just fundamentally change and transform and then you're eating the right things and so the weight loss will come um the fat loss will definitely come obviously you're going to be replacing some fat with muscle and so that's going to make your the scale look a bit weird so we don't get discouraged with that don't um uh you know don't get uh, too discouraged because your your weight might stabilize you can be like, oh my god i'm not losing any weight but your clothes will start fitting uh, more loosely uh you'll feel better and you'll continue to do more so i'll just keep doing what you're doing um generally you know when you're going to lift you're going to trigger a 36 hour growth cycle and so you don't really want to be doing the same muscle group sort of every day every other day is is fine but you don't want to overdo it you don't want to strain yourself and then you know tear a muscle or or develop tendonitis or something which you can do even on a carnivore diet but you really have to work at it um, and like I was doing some, some ridiculous sort of amounts of, of workouts, but eventually I was able to, uh, injure myself and, um, 
Uh, so you don't want to do that. So just keep doing that. Um, whatever you're doing, just, just make sure you're consistent. So if you're saying, I'm going to do it three days a week or four days a week, you make sure you do those four days a week and you do it every week and you do it consistently. And then um, never miss a day. If you, if you make an excuse to miss one day, you'll, you'll do it a thousand times. You'll never get on, on track. And so just do that. Whatever days you, you choose, you make sure you get those days and then you work very hard. It's not necessarily what you do, but how hard you do it. You really want to push yourself. You really want to go to uh, muscle fatigue and exhaustion and, uh, and go. If you've got, if you're doing 10 reps of something and you could have done 12, do 12. And, uh, and then, you know, then you'll start seeing that you'll feel better and you actually want to start to add in a fourth day and then a fifth day, maybe a sixth day and, uh, and just see how you go, but keep, keep working, keep pushing and keep, uh, building. So Mikey, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, he asks, um, Paul Saladino carnivore MD advocates organic fruit and honey in moderation. Would you be able to set up an interview with him? to hash out this topic. I, yeah, I would love to. I think, it, you know, I, I, you know, agree with a lot of things that he says, obviously I, I don't agree with that, but that's okay. You know, you're not, you're not really going to agree with everyone on everything unless you're in a cult. And so, uh, that's good that, you know, you don't agree with everyone on everything. Um, I think probably the only person I've ever really come close to agreeing with everything on is, is Thomas Sowell. And that's just because that guy just backs up everything, which is hard facts. Um, and so it's not about me agreeing with his opinion. It's just like, yep, that's what that is. That's, that's, there's, there's the proof right there. Um, and I understand, uh, Dr. Huberman is at, uh, um, Stanford as well. I don't know if you've run into to Thomas Sowell as well. That would be amazing. Um, uh, as well. And that's guys, one of my heroes for sure. Um, so just to answer a question here on Instagram as a keto adaptive, I have been following some people for a while now who tout the carnivore diet or the animal based diet. However, there is so much different conflicting information about whether or not to eat fruits and vegetables, nuts, etc. Uh, it has almost, it's almost impossible to draw a conclusion on whether or not something is good or bad for you. Yeah, it, it is difficult. There's a lot of conflicting information. Uh, I, I tend to go just to, to first principles. You know, we have a lot of epidemiological stuff, which can, you know, guide you in a certain direction, but it's not great. Um, it can be interesting, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not awesome. And um, so you go to first principles, you know, what are we, what, you know, we are an animal, we are biologically uh, designed and adapted to eat something. And I think that the preponderance of evidence suggests that humans are carnivores and that that is our primary um, uh, food source. Evolutionarily, going back 2 million years, basically primar primarily, at least, and almost exclusively carnivores, especially in certain regions up until very recently. And then you look at the fact that, you know, botanically, Plants contain toxins. They contain poisons, and we don't we don't have as many uh, defenses against these sorts of things uh, as as uh, other things do. I mean, look, and and we have more than say you know canines and felines, which it will most plants that we eat will kill them, right? And so you know that's a demonstration of the toxic nature of these plants, right? And they it's not that spinach is not you know deadly to other animals. It is you know. It, animals that don't have the protections. We have some of the protections, but uh, we don't have all of them. And, you know, like a koala has protections against, you know, the poisons that are in eucalyptus. We don't, you know, eucalyptus will make us very sick. And, and so, um, you know, that's what I go on, you know, like we're supposed to eat meat. That's what we're, we're, um, designed to do. And, uh, plants have things that aren't good for you. Now, how, how bad or good are these things? I don't, you know, that's, that's open for debate, but the fact that they do contain these toxins is, uh, well, it's, I mean, it's just a fact, you know, that that's not a, that's just a fact they do. That's a hard fact and in a hard science. And so, um, you know, and, and there's all these arguments about hormesis and all that sort of stuff, well, you know, maybe, but like, you know, there are thousands of different defense chemicals in plants and, um, you know, so maybe, you know, are all of these are all chemicals or all toxins, you know, um, you know, uh, are they all hormetic at a certain level? Every single one, you know, every, all the time, you know, I mean, you know, arsenic is at very low doses, it, you know, you know, some studies have found that it actually gives a, you know, a, a bit of an advantage, but just every single chemical ever, 
you know, do that? I don't know. I, I think that you'd have a hard time proving that. Um, and also, um, you know, what is the dose, you know, so, you know, oxalates, okay, well, well, how many, how many, you know, milligrams of oxalates are good for you and give you a hormetic benefit, you know, exactly how much that is, you know, how much you're getting in your food. I mean, how, how could you, right? And then there are like dozens or hundreds of other uh, defense chemicals that are in these plants as well. So, okay, so maybe you got the oxalates down as like a perfectly hormetic level, you know, exactly how much to eat to get that perfectly hormetic effect, which is like, first of all, you know, like, you know, be an adult and just extract it and just give yourself the, uh, the oxalates in, in like a, a perfect amount, like in a pill. That's why we, that's why we have pills instead of, you know, the naturopathic approach of just giving someone a couple of leaves of Fox club. We give them digitalis because we know actually how much is it is in there. And it doesn't come with all the different, uh, toxic, you know, other defense chemicals as well. So, you know, let's say that you're eating something, you have the perfect amount of digitalis, right? And you get that effect that you want. Great. What else is in there or all the other things in there giving you a hormetic, um, uh, effect at that exact dose, right? So are all these things in perfect hormetic balance? Probably not. I mean, that, that that's sort of getting into the land of the religious there that, you know, we're in the Garden of Eden and God just made everything just just perfect for us and that every plant has a perfect dose that's perfect for us. I don't I think that that's that's uh, quite a leap of faith uh, and there's no evidence for it. And uh, and you have a very hard time proving it. So that's sort of what I go on. And uh, and there are other reasons as well. I do uh, my video on um, why we are carnivores is with a slide presentation I've done. Uh, my recent uh, talk at the medical conference in Gold Coast on, you know, plants are trying to kill you. And then I've actually done a, a talk on fruit and honey and not being a good idea on carnivore. <coughs> the main reason being they have sugar and sugar is sugar is sugar. And just because sugar comes in honey or sugar comes in fruit and that fruit or that honey has other nutrients that can be beneficial to you, the sugar is not beneficial to you. You know, unless you're starving and you need the energy, which you could be, you know, and that then yes, that's an advantage. Uh, it's hormetic, and um, but that's only in a certain uh, circumstance. And so, you know, there's a ton of work from Dr. Lustig uh, from UCSF looking into uh, how how uh, fructose acts in your body and how it's actually broken down into the same byproducts as ethanol, and you get this same damage to your body from those breakdown products of fructose as you do the breakdown products of ethanol. And so, you know, it goes fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, uh, you know, peripheral insulin resistance and diabetes, and is even implicated in heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's. So uh, I think that that's probably a good reason to avoid those uh, unless you're starving and your know, fruit is not necessarily without toxins either. You know, citrus family, for instance, have, have furanocumarins which are very toxic. And like, even if you get them on your, your skin, if you get like lime juice on your skin, you're in the sun, it actually is, is photosensitive. It's a photosensitizer. It can, and gets activated by UV light and will bind to proteins and DNA and damage them and, and cause irreparable harm. And so people have actually gotten like second degree burns on their hands just from having lime juice on their hands, squeezing limes in the sunshine. They get, they get horribly burned. Uh, happened to my little brother when we were kids and uh, we thought it was like an allergic reaction, but, um, you know, looking back on it, like that's what it is because he's not actually allergic to limes. He's, he's, you know, he drinks Coronas and uh, maybe the Corona has some magic power, but I doubt it. Um, so, uh, NF chick one, thank you very much. That's very, very kind of you, uh, for the super chat. It's very, very nice of you. Um, my dad got diagnosed with two, one in size tumors and two one in size tumors in his brain. Um, he's currently on steroids for the inflammation, so he can walk and taking two other pills, one to keep uh, sugar levels down. Um, do you think carnivore is the way to go? He's on keto now. Thanks. I think that keto is definitely a good idea. Um, if you look at the work of uh, Professor Thomas Seafried from uh, Boston College. He is, um, you know, he's he's has like over 150 uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers on the subject, and um, and I've had him on my podcast. If you watch that that episode, um, it's very very clear. And I'm actually working with him to get a protocol going for uh, glioblastoma uh, brain cancers, and uh, we're starting up a study here at my uh, in my neurosurgical department here 
um, in Perth in order to uh, use these dietary methods uh, and basically using a ketogenic diet, keto carnivore diet um, in order to, uh, uh, as, an as an adjunct treatment to um, you know, chemo and radiation and to help our, our GBM patients. So I did a, a presentation at one of our grand rounds on the metabolic theory of cancer and discussed uh, all the different uh, studies and data showing this. There's actually a number of studies and there's actually a randomized control trials as well with sort of like low numbers, like 20 people looking at this and, and, and they all found benefit. And they all found that things were were, were uh, beneficial and there's a number of case reports and case series, retrospective case series and things like that with uh, uh, brain primary brain cancers and even metastatic disease uh, showing significant benefit. We don't have the big RCTs yet. We don't have the big, large number studies on these things, um, but everything is pointing in a very positive direction. And if you look at the cancer biology side of things, it makes very good sense that you just want to keep carbohydrates as far away from your diet as possible because, uh, you know, cancer cells, uh, feed on, on carbohydrates and they actually require f about 400 times the amount of carbohydrates as normal cells do. And so if you limit the amount of carbohydrates that are coming in, you stop eating carbohydrates and your body's going to make carbohydrates, but it's only going to be, you know, it's going to stay at a very normal level you are limiting the amount of energy available to that cancer. And so I think that's very, very beneficial. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Professor Seafried looks at in his animal models, it shows very good effect. And in the people that they have, have taken on this advice in their in case series and case studies, um, he gets their, their um, glucose ketone index down around one or below. And that's that, that is, is where you want to be. So if you look up GKI or glucose ketone index and Professor Thomas Seyfried, S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D, um, or go to my, my YouTube talk, talk with him, um, you'll find some papers where he talks about how to calculate a GKI and things like that. You take your blood sugar and your ketones and things like that. And, you, and there's a little equation that, that you can sort it out. And, that, and that's what you do. You try to keep that, um, that sort of at or below one with, um, diet and uh, maybe some calorie restriction or fasting, but you just want to keep that number down. Uh, I think that, that avoiding plants that have, you know, inflammatory effects and can, uh, sort of derail your immune system and make it, uh, you know, just make you just slightly less healthy is probably not a good idea when you're fighting these sorts of things off. And so I think that if you're eating physiologically and giving your body exactly what it needs and nothing that it doesn't need, that you're going to be in a better position uh, to fight this loss. So I'm very sorry to hear about your father. I think that, um, he's already on the right track and, and just, to, and those are just some little fine tuning things. And uh, I would definitely look up professor Seafried's work and, uh, and read as much about that as you can, because he's just, just done amazing work. Um, and, um, and as I, I, I think that that's really the way forward. I think that, um, that so if this pans out and we get these studies going, we can really prove this. I think that, you know, the stuff that the, the work that he's doing is like Nobel prize worthy. Um, and, uh, so I would definitely look at that. Um, John, thank you very much, uh, for the super chat, John. Uh, I think I have tendonitis in my back from chronic overuse on a vegan diet. And I'm sorry to hear that carnivore has made it better, but not perfect yet. Well, every back to hundred, well, that's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, well, it depends on how long you, you've been doing it. And, uh, I think that you'll, you will get a lot better and you can keep, you know, working your muscles and building up your muscles and that will strengthen them and, and, and relieve that damage. Um, there is such a thing as damage done. Um, and sometimes you can have permanent injuries, but I think it's unlikely in this case, if you just have, um, you know, there's some, some tendonitis and, and back pain, I think that you will be able to strengthen up your muscles and, and heal that. I think that, uh, just with, uh, rest and rehab that, uh, yeah, you should be able to to get back to normal. That's awesome. Very well done. Um, and Robin, thank you very much as well for the, for the super chat. Um, what ratio of protein to fat would you recommend for an older female? Um, I think a lot of it's individual. I think you want to shoot for about equal parts, equal grams of protein and fat. So like lean muscle to fat. Um, and, uh, and that will get you about 70% calories from fat. And then I think you just see how that makes you feel. 
and you get uh, how much energy you have, your, your skin and your hair, and everything's healthy, and your bowel motions. I think that bowel motions are a very good indicator of um, of uh, how much fat you're getting because you can only physiologically absorb a certain amount of fat uh, with your bile. You run out of bile, then most of that will spill out. You can absorb some fat after that, but most of it will spill out. And that that is what keeps your uh, stool soft. And so if you're only eating meat and only eating fat, not drinking coffee, not taking artificial sweeteners, which will both act as laxatives, then I think that you're, you can, you can tell by your stool. So if you're having dry, hard stools, then you're definitely not eating enough fat because your body's just absorbing every ounce of it. If you're getting like loose stools, then, you know, that's uh, that's a lot more fat than your body can handle. So I think you go for that. You really want enough protein and enough fat. That's really the main thing. Um, and then Mary, thank you very much. Uh, Mary asks, coming from a standard American diet, transition slowly or for microbiome or go in fast with guns blazing. Uh, thank you. So I, I think, I think most people will be fine. Um, your, your gut biome generally does change, uh, fairly quickly. I mean, cause it, it, it eats what you eat. And so if you're not, if you're, if you change what you're eating, that's going to promote, uh, different bugs, uh, to grow. And so I think that that's, uh, that will change fairly quickly with you. Um, you know, uh, professor, uh, K talks about how this can actually lead to problems down the track. I, I don't disbelieve him. You know, he's he's very well researched. I have a lot of respect for uh, for him. Um, and so, if he says something, I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot behind that that he's uh, looked into. Um, in practice, I I didn't have that problem, um, and I've I've helped you know coach and and a lot of patients and things like that I've had over the last few years uh, have not had that problem. And so. Um, you know, maybe if that if that comes down and you you start having that sort of an issue, maybe that's something that you you go back and and start transitioning off. But um, I think in general, most people can just just dive in head first, and that can be easier when you're sort of quitting something like you're quitting cigarettes, you're quitting smoking, you're quitting drinking. Um, you know that 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 cold turkey tends to work better than you just get it get in and get it done. Um, and uh, NF chick one uh, again. Thank you. Um, it's very kind of you again. I have topical dermatitis, uh, so bad on my fingers. I can't even work. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, I have to take the shot, uh, Dexbutant. Uh, don't think carnivore will cure this, uh, from your book, or do you think carnivore will cure this from your book? It sounds like it might, they very well could. I mean, contact, you know, um, it, it depends. You know, if you're getting like sort of contact dermatitis from something in your environment, then you need to sort of find out what that is and, and get that out of your environment. And, um, and then hopefully that will sort of relieve that. But yeah, there, a lot of people have, uh, have found that, that a lot of their skin issues, uh, resolve very well, especially when they're getting like more fat, like a lot of people with like psoriasis and eczema and things like that. They find that when they're, when they really get enough fat, they're increasing the amount of fat that they eat. That's when they find that they're, um, that their body starts to, to heal a bit better. But the main thing is you want to, eliminate out the things that are in your environment that are, that are triggering that. And so that could be something topical. It could be, you know, as simple as something like, you know, some of the soap or detergent or something like that you're using at home. Um, or it could be something you're eating. So if you go carnivore, you're, you're eliminating out a lot of things that, that could be causing that. And, uh, but there could be other things as well. So you just need to be mindful of that. And so you eliminate all these things out of your diet, you're giving your body, uh, what it needs and what it wants. And, uh, and you're, you're going to be a step ahead of everyone else. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then seeing if there's anything else in your environment that can trigger that off as well. Um, Dr. Chafee, would you ever have a sit down with another doctor who promotes a whole plant based, uh, based plant food diet and lifestyle and discuss differences and ideas? Well, I have actually, I've, I've done that actually dozens of times, uh, with, you know, doctors and, uh, clinicians, and even you know PhDs in nutrition and nutritionists. Uh, I love having those conversations. I really, I really you know, uh, you know, revel in them. And um, I suppose you mean uh, have a sit down talk on camera. Uh, if they're willing to, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, not everyone is. You know, they they sort of find that uncomfortable and uh, and maybe confrontational, which obviously you know you don't want to, people to feel feel that way. And um, you know, especially when they're on sort of camera and they feel like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be 
set up or something like that. So it's uh, it's difficult. But yeah, I've had I've had dozens of conversations with people. I've I've done live debates with you know nutritional the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. Um, I did um, a debate with on carnivore versus vegan diets with three uh, uh, vegan. Uh, proponents. One was a cardiologist. Uh, another was a pediatrician who did her, her master's in public health at Harvard, and the other was a, was an expert in the microbiome. And so we, you know, we all sort of discussed all of our, our ideas. Um, and then uh, you can find that on the Australian, you know, ACNEM, A C N E M. That they still have that. We also did. I was also involved in a debate that that they did on cholesterol, and there were two. Uh, you know, very well-known cardiologist on my team, Asim Horcha and um, and Professor. Oh gosh, I always forget his name. Anyway, a professor of cardiology here in Australia, and and we went against you know sort of three cardiologists and professors of medicine. I was the, I was the only non-cardiologist, which is kind of funny, but uh, you know we 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 did you know ex- extremely well against them, and we we won like eighty-six percent of the vote for that debate. And so you can find those. And so, and then I did a, a video called um, "Things Vegans Say," where I sort of addressed some of the arguments in those uh, in those vegans' arguments, and just sort of said like why I thought that they uh, they they weren't as robust as uh, maybe they sounded. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I really like those conversations. I really like going uh, and ha- and talking to people, especially when, when they really know what they're talking about, because I I don't want to be a victim of confirmation bias and just talk about things just because. You know, I think they're right, and I'm not seeing the other side of things. I want to know the other side of the story. I want to know the the other argument. I want someone to come up with new arguments I've never heard before. I was actually a little disappointed in that that um, debate with the carnivore versus vegan diets because I was thinking I was like, oh, I've got all these like you know really bright, intelligent, educated people. You know, they must they they might have something like new that I've never heard before. So I'm going to really have to be on my game. And uh, no, it was it was the same stuff, exactly the same stuff. You know, same same tired stuff we've been hearing for the last fifty years. That that's wrong. It's demonstrably wrong, and so it was it was quite easy to pick apart. Um, Sean, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, Ninety day carnivore, continuous running nose, especially when working. Is this the histamine reaction? If so, will it eventually go away? Yeah, it could be something you're eating. Depends on what you're eating. Um, you know, sometimes when I get when I when I'm eating a steak or something like that, I, I find that I get a bit of a runny nose, but it's, it generally stops. Like if you're getting runny nose all day, you know, during the day, and not just directly after you're eating, there's probably something more to do with your environment uh, that you're that you're in, and maybe getting some some allergies. But um, you know, it could be if it's something to do with what you're eating. Uh, just you know, you can try changing up what you're eating. But I think that if it's if it's distant to your meal, it's probably uh, unrelated. You know, so if you're just, if you're, if you're not, if you're only eating at night and all day, you have a runny nose, maybe less likely, but you can still change up what you're eating and, uh, and take a look. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. I think that, um, I should probably call it there because it's, uh, it's, uh, past 11 here and I've, uh, I'm actually working this weekend and so I'm up early tomorrow and then working all day. So, uh, but thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, oh, and someone just asked opinion of Paleo Medicina to treat diseases. I actually literally just released a video with the head of Paleo Medicina, um, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Sophia Clemens. So uh, you can watch that now. You can go on there. And uh, I thought that was a great, great chat. Um, but yeah, well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you guys coming on. Hopefully we'll be doing more of these, trying to do... Um, I do them every week with uh, you know, my Patreon, Patreon guys, but I, I, you know, I like to do these... Uh, big open ones as well because it gets a lot of people uh, and asking a lot of uh, interesting questions, which is always which is always sort of fun to fun to do. So thank you everyone uh, for coming on. Thank you everyone for uh, you know joining and submitting questions. Um, I'll have to f- figure out about this whole request to join thing and what in God's name is that's about. But a lot of people have been asking to join, and I'm a bit nervous about it because I don't know who they are. <laughs> and so I don't know exactly what that's going to do. And, um, you know, it might be that you end up talking to one person directly and maybe that's interesting for people. Um, maybe I'll try it sometime. Just roll the dice. We'll see. Uh, but, um, in any case, guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And, uh, hopefully see you guys. Um, maybe, maybe in the coming weeks, we'll probably, I'll try to do, uh, some more of these. So, all right, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for coming by. Strict carnivore. Uh, you have to look at stress and get out other things. 
in your environment and uh, and, and cut out the beef, pork. No, oh, sorry, not the beef, the pork, chicken, and farmed fish, especially farmed fish is terrible. Um, just cut out the dairy for good measure. Um, you just, just play it as safe as possible and just go red meat and water. 